Welcome, everyone. I'm Jim Fleming. Um, welcome to the BU Law Review Symposium on Jack Balkan's splendid new book, The Cycles of Constitutional Time. I'm going to make some very short introductions and serve as the moderator of this opening panel. Um, now, a brief overview. Um, this opening panel will be from 1245 to 2. And then we'll have two additional panels later uh, in the afternoon with breaks between them. Um, now, before I make the introductions, I want to thank uh, Elizabeth Clancy, our events manager, for all her good work in setting up this program. Now, first of all, Jack Balkan, the author of the book we're going to be analyzing, The Cycles of Constitutional Time, is Knight Professor of Constitutional Law and the First Amendment at Yale Law School. He's the founder and director of Yale's Information Society Project, which is an interdisciplinary center that studies law and new information technologies. Um, and Jack is undoubtedly in the pantheon of constitutional theorists working today. Not only is he an incredibly insightful and productive scholar, he makes constitutional theory fun. Uh, so I hope you'll enjoy the discussion today. Um, we're also honored in this first panel to have as our commentators, uh, Stephen Levitsky and Daniel Zivlot. Um, Stephen Levitsky is the David Rockefeller Professor of Latin American Studies and Professor of Government at Harvard University. Daniel Zivlot is e Eaton Professor of Government at Harvard University. And they are the authors of the recent widely discussed book, How Democracies Die. Not only is it a New York Times bestseller, it's been translated into what, 22 languages? Uh, uh, and so we're uh, honored to have them here opening up the comment with, uh, with comments on Jack's book. So the format will be Jack will speak for about 10 minutes to introduce some of the themes or arguments of the book. Uh, then Steve will speak for about 10 minutes, followed by Daniel speaking for 10 minutes. Then Jack will have up to 10 minutes to respond and then we'll have questions uh, uh, from uh, the participants and audience. So Jack, take it away. Thank you very much, Jim. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Thank you for, uh, and thank you to BU and uh, the BU Law Review uh, for arranging this symposium uh, on the book. Um, so what I was going to do in a, a short period of time was let everyone know what the book is basically about, uh, talk a little, and then talk a little bit about what has happened since the book, uh, I wrote the book, which was March uh, 2020, and the book was published, which was September 2020, uh, and today. Uh, that has changed or altered my way of thinking. Um, so to bring, in other words, the argument of the book up to the present. Uh, now, so what the book's called The Cycles of Constitutional Time. And uh, I uh, talk about the long history of American political and constitutional development in terms of three cycles. You should understand that a cycle doesn't cause anything. Uh, it, politics is not astronomy, but I'm interested in the interrelationship between uh, the structures, the constitutional structures and political structures Americans have produced and how folks working within those structures behave. And so the claim is there are some regularities in uh, American constitutional and political history. And so I identify three uh, major kinds of recurrences or cycles. It's always different each time. It's never exactly the same. Uh, but the famous Mark Twain line is that even if history doesn't repeat itself, it may rhyme. So the first of these cycles is the rise and fall of political regimes. And here I'm, uh, I'm following in the footsteps of my colleague at Yale, Steve Skoranek, uh, who's written about uh, cycles of presidential uh, leadership and cycles of political regimes. The idea is that because of our uh, system, our constitutional system and its representational system, it becomes very difficult for a party uh, to, be, to become dominant, to get its arms around all the different uh, levers of power in America. But once it does, um, then what happens is it tends to dominate politics for a long time, and it tends to shape the agendas of politics, what's politically possible for a long time. So there are, there are about six of these uh, regimes, political regimes, each with a dominant political party from the founding up to the present. Uh, 
Um, and so I'm interested in the rise and fall of these political regimes and the dominant parties that, uh, that are, are part of them. Uh, the second uh, cycle that I'm interested in is a very, very long cycle of polarization and depolarization. Once again, it's caused by certain features of the American political system. Uh, so the uh, American, the, our, our modern American political party system with two parties, basically, two major parties, is really a product of the Civil War. Uh, and then after the Civil War, there's a long period of polarized politics through the Gilded Age. And then after the Gilded Age, into the Progressive Era, something happens. It starts to depolarize and, uh, and it stays depolarized. It bottoms out uh, in uh, the New Deal period, and then it stays uh, pretty much depolarized until um, uh, the Voting Rights Act in 65. So race turns out to be an important part of this story. Um, and uh, it starts to polarize again. And then right around the 90s, it just starts to shoot up. Uh, the polarization becomes really amazing and, in my view, unbearable. Uh, it, it, very difficult uh, a situation for American uh, democracy. The third cycle that I'm interested in uh, is the cycle of what I call constitutional rot and constitutional renewal. And this idea is simply that America is a democratic republic, and there's a very long history of thinking about republics, which suggests that they are delicate things, easily corrupted. Uh, the, we would say the people lose civic virtue, the institutions break down, norms of trust and cooperation, uh, uh, you know, decay. And uh, this is a characteristic feature of republics. The, fr the framers of our constitution understood this. They had seen every Republican history had eventually decayed and corrupted and fallen into, uh, uh, into a mobocracy or an oligarchy or, or what we today would call an authoritarian government. And so they tried to design the constitution so that it would last as long as possible. It could ride out the bad times so that the good times could come again. And to a remarkable extent, uh, with the assistance of later generations, that's kind of happened. There have been these episodes of constitutional rot, decay in our institutions, republicanism, uh, followed by periods of renewal. And this is all relative because of course the system has never been fully democratic and it's never been fully Republican either. So the, the basic problem that we face, or at least we were facing when I wrote the book, was that we seem to be at the very end of a, a dominant party's control over a regime. The Republican party's control of American politics seems to be ending. We were at, one can only hope, is the, uh, of the, the peak of a cycle of party polarization a mutual enmity and hatred we haven't seen since the Civil War. And we are in the depths of a period of constitutional rot, of corrupt politics, of norms breaking down, of, uh, of uh, norms of cooperation and trust breaking down and deep distrust of the country's elites and institutions. And so what we have is, is the concatenation of these three different cycles. And what you have is a very, very dark and troubling time, which I don't have to tell you about. Uh, what I'm interested in or what, what, uh, what I was wanted to mention is um, what, has happened since. This is the book. The book was written in March 2020. Here we are almost a year later. And um, my, my view at this point is that although it looks like the Reagan regime that has structured American politics since the 1980s is nearing its end, all the signs are there, we still don't have a clear conclusion. Uh, part of that has to do with the fact that um, uh, the Democratic Party didn't win a decisive victory in 2020. Um, and uh, the, the COVID pandemic, uh, the economic contraction have handed the Democrats an opportunity to create a new regime with a new uh, dominant party and a new set of interests. Uh, but whether or not they'll actually capitalize on the possibilities, we don't know yet. Uh, Democrats have blown their chances before in 1896 and uh, they were unable to do it in 2008. It may well be in hindsight that this was this is a crucial turning point in American history and politics, but we just don't know the answer yet. I will say that if the Democratic Party doesn't take advantage of its current uh, majorities in the House and Senate and control the presidency and eliminate the filibuster, which prevents it from passing the kind of legislation that would protect democracy, then it may very well blow its chance. Uh, it seems to me that if the filibuster is altered, it doesn't have to be fully eliminated, but if it's altered in a way that allows the Democrats to pass new voting rights legislation and new legislation to clean up politics and uh, reform our decrepit system, well, that would be a very strong sign that we've turned the corner, uh, but, but we really can't say yet. The second thing is that 
uh, the polarization of our politics is just unbearable. Um, it's gotten as it's as bad as it's ever been. Uh, my book argues that uh, what's going to happen to the two major parties is that their political coalitions will become increasingly incoherent. I think we're starting to see that now, especially in the Republican Party, uh, which seems to be on the verge of a civil war. But the, the, the line that I drew in the book between a populist wing and a neoliberal wing has now appears to be a fight between an institutionally conservative wing and a Trumpist wing. Uh, of the Republican Party. So it, it slight, has a slightly different flavor than the way I described it in the book. And the third point, and it's what I'll close with, is that um, to me, the most worrisome feature of our current uh, system uh, is not polarization so much, but constitutional rot. That, that if anything, the last year has shown that the rot in our institutions, uh, the undermining of our democratic uh, structures, uh, the destruction of the norms of uh, cooperation and trust that are necessary for a democracy to thrive, it's gotten even worse. And we are under uh, the uh, shadow of uh, uh, what my colleague at Yale, uh, Tim Snyder, calls the big lie, uh, the belief by a very significant number of the population that the election was stolen and that uh, politicians are finding it convenient to play to that lie and continue to hoodwink large segments of the public. And when you have a situation in which a sizable percentage of the public is living on lies and does not believe in the fundamental legitimacy of our democratic institutions, this is a very, very difficult time for uh, American history. Uh, Steve was uh, um, kind enough to give a talk at another presentation of a book that Sandy Levinson and I wrote, and, and he pointed out how deeply a dangerous our situation was. And, and I said at that point that I thought that we were on a knife's edge. Nothing in the past year has convinced me that um, the danger is still not present. I mean, I think this is a, a very fraught time in American politics. I'm a professional optimist. I believe we will get out of it, but I think you should not understate how dangerous our current situation is. Thank you, Jim. Steve Levinsky. Okay, uh, I'm going to continue on that uh, somewhat dark note. Um, but first of all, this is a, a, a wonderful, wonderful book. I, I enjoyed reading. I learned a tremendous amount from it. And it is truly an honor uh, to be here in my, in my dining room uh, discussing the book. I'm going to spend most of the time uh, challenging the notion that Donald Trump is, uh, is Jimmy Carter and that this is all sort of a temporary eclipse. Uh, but let me start um, by highlighting some of the things that I, that I really love about this book. Um, first of all, I found the chapter on the rise and fall of judicial review and the presidential regimes really, really fascinating. Uh, U.S. parties flip in a, in a really quite predictable way on the issue of judicial review, depending on where we are in the regime, which means, among other things, that uh, progressives are about to become fierce opponents of judicial review. Um, I also really uh, enjoyed and appreciated and learned from the book's discussion of the role of courts in polarized political settings. Uh, as, as all of you, I think, know, the old sort of mid 20th century conventional wisdom in the study of American politics was that the Supreme Court wasn't really a counter majoritarian institution. It was an essentially majoritarian uh, institution. It could be relied upon to uphold the national elite consensus and help to bring wayward local and state governments and, and, and others into, into line with this national consensus. Um, that wasn't necessarily so wrong in the 1950s and 60s, but as Jack shows very clearly and impressively, the court's role varies considerably uh, depending on the political context. And in the context of polarization, when that national elite uh, consensus disappears, the court inevitably, probably inevitably, gets politicized. Judges are carefully screened for their ideological and partisan loyalty. Uh, and the ones who were selected tend to emerge out of different judicial establishments, with pretty different norms and worldviews, uh, which means that the justices that emerge speak to very different audiences. As a result, uh, as Jack points out, they may not be able to recognize or to halt constitutional rot. In fact, their partisan rulings in a, in a, in a polarized context may even reinforce or accelerate constitutional rot, a self-reinforcing pattern, I should point out. 
So all this means that in the context of extreme polarization, like, like uh, at, at the time when we most need it, the Supreme Court cannot be relied upon to act as a neutral arbiter in cases of constitutional conflict. The court will not save us. So what will save us? This is where I grow a bit more skeptical. Um, to exaggerate a little bit, Jack tells us that time will save us. Drawing, as he mentioned, on Skoronik's regime theory of the presidency, Jack tells us that American politics is cyclical. American politics goes through cycles or presidential regimes. Uh, and we're at the end of one of those cycles now. The end of the cycle is very often characterized by a failed crisis ridden presidency or what Skoronik calls a disjunctive presidency. This is James Buchanan, it's Herbert Hoover, it's Jimmy Carter. And the argument is that Trump is another or was another disjunctive president presiding over the final throes of the Reagan regime. The implication, or one implication, is that what we're experiencing is not so new, it's not unprecedented, it's just the end of another cycle. We've been here before, uh, which means that, that there may be no need for people like Ziblatt or and me to get hysterical and write books about the death of democracy. What's dying is not necessarily democracy, it's the Reagan coalition. Transition from one regime to another can sometimes get a bit bumpy, but if history is any guide, the book tells us our democracy should muddle through. So this is a uh, recipe for optimism. Jack is a professional optimist. Um, Trump's not to door about Jimmy Carter. And if politics moves in predictable cycles and we're at the end of the cycle, then maybe we can rest a little easier. Our recent unpleasantness is only a temporary condition, Jack writes on page seven. Polarization does not have to get worse and worse. We can bottom out after a period of constitutional rot and experience a process or a period of constitutional renewal. And then on page 65, this eclipse is purely temporary. Maybe. This certainly is the end of the Reagan era. Uh, we certainly might be on the brink of a second progressive era, but I'm skeptical. Politics does not work in cycles. There are many strands of literature on democracy and regime change and comparative politics spanning over decades. There are theories that highlight the role of economic development, economic performance, of inequality, of institutions like political parties and party systems. But none of them, none, suggest that regime, regime trajectories are cyclical. Cyclical theories depict a strictly endogenous process of political change. One event leads to another, which leads to another. But political outcomes, regime outcomes, are always invariably everywhere shaped by exogenous factors, by changes in context. And those exogenous factors can easily set countries, set regimes on new trajectories, trajectories that very often are self-reinforcing rather than cyclical. In other words, the further you go down the path, the harder it is to get back to the place you came. Crises do emerge periodically in politics. Coalitions do break down, parties realign, but crises do not always, at least not immediately, lead to renewal. Sometimes they lead to violence. Sometimes they lead to democratic breakdown, civil war. But we might've looked at Chilean democracy in 1971, or Uruguayan democracy in 1973, or Venezuelan democracy in 1992, and said that the recent unpleasantness, unpleasantness in those countries was only a temporary condition. These were, after all, established democracy, all three of them. So we could have said or, or, or hoped that the eclipse was purely temporary. Polarization would be followed by depolarization. Democratic renewal would follow. And all three democracies, as we know, uh, plunged into violent dictatorship. Polarization did not lead to depolarization. It wrecked democracy. So let me just highlight a few exogenous or contextual factors that I think plausibly make the current unpleasantness different from pre previous periods, and which suggests that we're not, or at least not necessarily, on the brink of renewal. Rather, we may be on a self-reinforcing path to greater unpleasantness. One factor is the nationalization of politics. Changes in media structure and in party and interest group organization have largely done away with the centuries-old disjuncture in this country that separated local and national party politics. It is no longer the case that all politics is local. Sean Hannity is everywhere. Our national parties are more coherent and more cohesive than ever before in history. And that undermines, makes very difficult 
the kind of cross-party alliances that helped to depolarize our politics in the past. Second exogenous fact, uh, as Liliana Mason and others have shown, the cleavages underlying our politics are now almost completely overlapped, more than, than really any other period in history. Democrat, Republican, liberal, conservative, urban, rural, religious, secular. There are practically no more cross-cutting cleavages, and that has led to an intensification of partisan identities and partisan hatred that we've not experienced since the Civil War era. Third and related, we're in the middle of a transition that to my knowledge, no democracy has ever successfully undergone. One in which a, 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 a long dominant ethnic group um, loses its majority and dominant status. The white Christians are not just any constituency, they're not just any group. Not only were they once an overwhelming electoral majority in this country, but not that long ago, they occupy the top rung in all of this country's social, economic, political, cultural hierarchy. So the presidency, Congress, Supreme Court, governor's mansions, they were the CEOs, the newscasters, the pillars of local community. Losing a majority, crucially, losing one's dominant social status can be a deeply threatening thing. And many Republican voters, not all, many Republican voters feel like the country that they grew up in is being taken away from them. That for many feels like an existential threat. A recent poll by the uh, American Enterprise Institute, sponsored by the AEI, found that 56% of Republicans agree with the statement that the traditional American way of life is disappearing so fast that we may have to use force to save it. Do you think that these guys are open to a cross-party alliance with populist Democrats? You are missing something about American politics. Fourth, for the first time, our parties are divided along urban rural lines. Throughout US history, our parties, the major parties had urban and rural wings. But today, as everyone knows, Democrats are overwhelmingly based in the big metropolitan areas. Republicans are overwhelmingly based in sparsely populated territory. This is a problem because the US electoral system favors sparsely populated territory. The electoral college is biased towards sparsely populated states. Most state legislatures are pretty heavily biased towards, towards uh, sparsely populated areas. The US Senate is heavily biased towards sparsely populated states. And because the Senate approves Supreme Court justices, the Supreme Court is also biased towards sparsely populated states. Not only does that threaten us with minority rule, but it has direct implications for Jack's cyclical theory. For this, for Jack's theory to work, the Democrats have to win elections and the Republicans have to lose them. Now there's some evidence of an electoral shift and Jack is absolutely right when he writes that the GOP is, and I quote, ripe for an electoral reckoning. Heck, the Republicans have only won the popular vote one time since I was in college, since 1988. Um, but there's a hitch. Counter-majoritarian institutions give the Republicans an electoral crunch. The rural bias of our institutions allow the Republicans to hold on to power without having to win national majorities. They can control the presidency, the Senate, the Supreme Court, with 47, 48% of the vote, of the national vote, that electoral crutch, which Danny and I call constitutional welfare, has weakened the Republican Party's incentive to adapt. Yes, Jack is right that the Trumpist coalition is not sustainable over the long run. It is unlikely to survive generational change, but our electoral institutions are going to allow a white nationalist GOP to hang on for quite a while longer. Long enough, I think, to do considerable damage to our institutions, and I am finishing. So I see no imminent signs of renewal. Our recent unpleasantness is becoming arguably not temporary, but chronic. Polarization is likely to continue, which given our constitutional structure is a recipe for serious dysfunction. As Danny and I argue in the book, the US constitutional system of checks and balances only works when it's reinforced by strong democratic norms. When norms of restraint, norms of forbearance disappear, divided government descends into permanent institutional wealth, uh, warfare. Excuse me. We are sliding into a world of constant institutional crisis, a world of government shutdowns, partisan impeachments, stolen Supreme Court seats, court packing, fabricated national emergencies, and crisis-ridden elections. This function, even in the best of cases, can have devastating consequences. First of all, it prevents our country from dealing with some of the most serious uh, problems facing society from pandemics to climate change. 
But crucially, this function is beginning to erode public confidence in our democratic system. When governments consistently fail to respond to citizens' most pressing problems, citizens eventually lose faith in the system. According to a recent study, the percentage of Americans who say they are dissatisfied with our democracy has risen from less than 25% a generation ago, 2000, to 55% today. Uh, and when societies lose confidence, when we lose confidence that democracy can resolve our problems, citizens grow vulnerable, more vulnerable to the appeals of demagogues who promise to get things done by other means. So I don't think we can be confident that the eclipse will pass. We're on a very dangerous path. And many of the self-correcting mechanisms that we thought we could rely on, like electoral competition, are not going to help us enough. Uh, so exiting this path, I think, requires uh, thoroughgoing institutional reform, reforms that are pretty well known to you folks, and some of which are nicely elaborated in Jack's book. Um, so I hope Jack's right that we're on the brink of a second progressive era because we are sure as hell going to need it. Thanks. Thank you very much, Steve Levitsky. Um, next, we have uh, Daniel Zablat. Go ahead. Great. Thank you, uh, everybody. And so Steve and I work together. We talk constantly on these themes, but we developed our comments independently of each other. But you'll see we have a bit of a mind mill because there's some points of overlap. But I think I have some additional points uh, to make. So first, I just want to say, of course, what a great honor it is and what a pleasure it was to read this book. Uh, and I just want to say that I'm inspired by and agree with what I take to be the main punchline of this, of this really wonderfully readable book. Uh, and that punchline, I think, is that we live today in a world of hyperpartisan polarization. Our institutions have become not only dysfunctional, but are also increasingly weaponized in an escalating spiral of constitutional hardball. And the result is what, uh, what Jack calls constitutional rot, or what we might think of as, as democratic decay. But the, the, the kind of real punchline at some level uh, that I had not really fully appreciated until reading the book was that the judiciary is not the cure for these ailments. Indeed, it too has fallen prey uh, to these same dynamics and now has become a, sort of, a source of partisan entrenchment and anti-democratic blockage. And so what I really appreciate most about this book is understanding the precise ways in which polarization has rendered the judiciary increasingly useless in addressing the ills of our democracy. Uh, and in particular, this notion that because of lifetime appointments in our federal judiciary, a party can continue to exert influence on our politics long beyond the passing of the apex of its power. So, you know, we all know that conservative judges all born in the 19th century halted Roosevelt's program in the 1930s. Uh, likewise, whatever uh, our legislative ambitions are to reform democracy in the Biden era, these are also going to be constrained by the long arm of the past uh, because of conservative domination of the federal judiciary today. So in a sense, the Reagan regime will continue to influence us from the grave. And this may be different than earlier eras because the court itself is only one institution in this broader web of counter-majoritarian institutions that are also increasingly favoring Republicans. So as Steve noted, chief among these are the US Senate, uh, the Electoral College, and even smaller uh, practices like the, the filibuster in the US Senate. Now it's true uh, that of course the Electoral College, the US Senate have always overrepresented rural areas, uh, but, and they've always been, in this sense, counter-majoritarian institutions. But again, as Steve also noted, as our electoral geography has shifted over time to make population density nearly a perfect predictor of Democratic Party vote share, this now means that the Republican Party, not, not only rural areas are overrepresented, but Republican parties have also now been systematically overrepresented in our political system. So our counter-majoritarianism now has a deeply partisan tinge. And because the presidential, because president nominates and the Senate confirms our judiciary, the court also reflects this bias as well. So you combine all of these factors together and we see that the judiciary, the way we select our president, the rural bias of the US Senate and the long arm of the past represent crutches for the Republican party. Counter-majoritarian checks that risk turning our system into a system of minority rule. And this all, by the way, reduces the need for the Republican party itself to adapt. So as we watch the formerly dominant majority party of the Reagan era, the Republican Party limp with the aid of these crutches off into the sunset, where it is fast becoming a minority party, we shouldn't be deceived by vague feelings of sympathy 
because as it does this, it's leaving in its wake a disastrously polarizing wreckage, and it has locked in its advantages. The only way out, therefore, as Professor Vulcan makes clear, is radical institutional reforms to empower majorities. And this is, this is why he calls for a new progressive era, and I agree fully with this call. You know, I would put on this list voting rights reform, adding states, rethinking the electoral college. But a major roadblock, and this is something I didn't fully appreciate until now, a major roadblock to, all, roadblock to this reform agenda of our democracy is the court system itself, fully dominated by the previous era's declining majority. We have to remember it was a more liberal version of the current Supreme Court that undid the Voting Rights Act in 2013. So even if we attach John Lewis's name to it, will the voting rights bills in front of the current Congress to institute automatic voter registration and other reforms withstand the scrutiny of our current court? We risk, in this sense, falling into a reform trap. And so that's, again, why, is why Professor Balkan calls for a set of major reforms to the court system itself. So, for example, as I read, as it kind of became clear to me that the absence of retirement age for federal judges clearly raises the stakes of our politics and also locks in previous majorities. So um, Jack proposes a series of inst interesting reforms to lower the stakes of our politics, instituting regular and predictable Supreme Court appointments, creating a practical equivalent of term limits for the Supreme Court, for Supreme Court justices, and also giving the Supreme Court less control over its docket. Now, I find this set of institutional reforms really compelling. I do wonder, by the way, you know, why not simply institute a retirement age? Um, you know, so I'd actually enjoy to, to hear the chance a bit more about these proposals and the rationale for this more elaborate proposal. So, so I agree with all of this. Where I do depart from the book um, in, in similar ways as Steve uh, is when diagnosing the problem that we confront. Because I think that the challenges facing our democracy may actually be worse than this book suggests. Uh, which is not to say that I'm not optimistic. I'm feeling more optimistic than Steve today, which doesn't always happen, but I'm feeling more optimistic than Steve today. But I do think we need to fully confront the scale of the problem that is in front of us. To put it simply, I think the language of cycles in the title of the book and in the first half of the books misleads us and in fact diminishes the scale of the problem. Now, I do think there, are, maybe unlike Steve, I do think there are cycles in politics, um, but I'm not sure that what Jack has described count as cycles. So a central thesis uh, in the book is that our current predicament represents this unfortunate aligning of these three cycles, the regime cycle, the polarization cycle, and a constitutional rot cycle. And because they are cycles, they are, as, as he notes, temporary. Uh, and in fact, on page 65, uh, Jack says he promises us that we will escape. Um, so uh, if we do face a series of cycles that endogenously swing back and forth like a pendulum, then indeed we ought not be too worried because ra in radical reform, uh, institutional form wouldn't be as necessary. But given Jack's description of the causes of each of these cycles, I think that we are not actually facing a series of cycles. These, the three threats that he identifies are being mislabeled as cycles. So Jack tells us, and I agree with this largely, that our current polarization has a couple of major causes, growing economic inequality, cultural fights, fights over immigration, and I would add a race to that. Likewise, the, sec the third cycle, constitutional rot, that has four horsemen, as he says, a series of four uh, plausible uh, causes, high inequality, high polarization, governance failures, and declining trust. But this means that two of the three cycles, at least, have causes external or exogenous to the cycles themselves. The great uh, economist Albert Hirschman, in a wonderful 1982 book, uh, Shifting Involvements, writes about the concept of cycles. And what he says, uh, and he's somebody who embraces the notion of cycles, I should say. He says, the construction of any theory of cycles must fate, face a difficult task, quoting Hirschman here. To be persuasive, such a theory must be endogenous. That is, one phase must be shown to ar arise necessarily out of the preceding one, just as any useful business cycle theory must be able to show how the economic downturn or bust follows necessarily from the preceding upswing or boom, and vice versa. If outside events like wars or spectacular inventions can be shown to play a decisive role in making for the periodic turning points, then the cycle is not a cycle because it's exogenously determined. So my point here is that by calling constitutional rot and polarization cycles, we suggest they are self-correcting. I wish they were, but I think as Jack actually makes clear in his own account, they are not. They're driven by other factors, inequality, fights over immigration and race, declining trust that are endemic, enduring, 
persistent, and that are only undone if our political institutions work. And that's exactly the catch-22 we're in. Inequality is not going anywhere anytime soon. Neither are the cultural fights that mark our politics. This means that polarization nor constitutional rot are going anywhere anytime soon. And because the institutions necessary to address these underlying causes are themselves constrained by polarization and constitutional rot, we can't undo the very problems that landed us where we are in the first place. So we are in this sense in a tighter bind, I think, than the notions of cycle suggest. But despite this, and in fact, because of the dire reading that's actually in Jack's account and the description of the sources of these cycles, of what he's calling these cycles, I actually couldn't agree more with the conclusion. So at the end of the day, I think I agree with the conclusion that the only way out uh, for us is a broad-based social movement of renewal on the model of the progressive era that allows us to double down on democracy. You know, how we get there is, of course, exactly the thing we need to talk about. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daniel Devon. Uh, so, uh, Jack, you can take uh, up to 10 minutes to respond. And um, while you're speaking, let me say to the uh, uh, other panelists and attendees, if you have questions you'd like to put to uh, Jack Balkan or to Steve Levitsky or Daniel Zablat, use the Q&A function uh, to, 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 to write your question. Uh, and then uh, I'll call on, uh, 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 and then I'll, I'll ask the questions and then uh, I'll let the speakers answer. Go ahead, Jack. Um, thank you. Uh, fabulous, uh, fabulous comments. Um, I wanna, uh, I'll address them sort of in the reverse order uh, in which they were offered. But uh, I have two big ideas I want to talk about, and you'll see that they're very sympathetic to uh, what Steve and Daniel have said. I want to dig down into this, I think, very important idea that any attempt to try to describe social behavior <coughs> in terms of cycles uh, presupposes endogeneity. That is, that things come from the inside of the system and that the forces within the side of the system lead the system to evolve. And uh, one of the criticisms that both of them have made in different ways is, well, that's not a good account of what's going on in the United States. It seems that so many of the important forces are exogenous. That is, they're coming from outside the institutions and they're pushing the institutions in unpredictable ways. And for that reason, we really can't speak of cycles at all. This is a point that they quote Hirschman for. And I don't really disagree with this, uh, this basic idea but I'm interested in pushing on the question of what we should regard as exogenous to the American political system and what we should regard as endogenous. Uh, so I'm gonna actually think about our system in a more capacious way than, um, uh, than uh, either Daniel or Steve did. Uh, in my view, at least my reading of history is that the American political and constitutional system is a, um, a system that is continually responding to uh, economic and technological change and features the, uh, the emergence of social mobilizations. Um, and uh, I'm also a, a, a scholar of social movements in the constitution. So this stuff is like, it's just how I think about it. So I've always thought about uh, social mobilizations and demographic changes as being a part of the American system of constitutional development rather than being exogenous to it. And similarly, I thought about the, the, the political economy issues as being part of the design of the system. Now, it's true, it's just true that you can't put everything inside the political and social system. Um, you can't put diseases inside it. You can't put a nuclear war inside it. There are just so many things that even if you try to expand what's in the system as opposed to what's out of it, you'll just never be able to include all of it. But I, I do think it's important to understand that when we look from the standpoint of the system itself, it's really important to understand that political economy questions are inside the system, not outside them, and the role of social movements and demographic change is inside it, not outside it. And finally, it's really important to understand that the process of American constitutionalism has been one of continuous experimentation with the basic structures of governance itself. Uh, certainly, 
you know, that's the civics, uh, the civics class story of America, but I take it quite seriously. When a new regime forms, it has an opportunity not only to create a new uh, durable majority party, but it also is handed the opportunity to fundamentally change the party structure, the rules of politics, and institutional forms. And when we look at each successful transition, we see these things happening. So you start with the Jeffersonians and the Jeffersonians do a whole bunch of things to the federal judiciary. Uh, there are various reforms uh, in the structure of government. In fact, the Jeffersonians effectively remake the history of the founding in their own image so that they can basically construct a politics um, that is conducive to their maintenance as a majority party. Same thing also uh, with the, how the president selected. Same thing happens again with the, the Republicans in the 1860s. There's a vast revolution in the structures of government that comes with the new Republican regime. Uh, the Democrats fail in 1896 and uh, the Republican party gains a second wind and they basically, uh, uh, they basically uh, co-opt and assimilate certain features of institutional change to help them stay in power. With the New Deal, you have a fundamental change in party systems and structures. Um, it's on the wave of a social mobilization. So you have lots of changes in governance. And so th that's why I say it's too early to tell whether uh, the Democratic Party is going to be able to successfully mount a significant change in our politics in a new regime. It goes to the points that both Daniel and Stephen made, which is that the Republican Party has been given what you might call an artificial boost, they call it crutches, in continuing to control politics even when they don't control a majority of the population. The rural advantages, um, the uh, limitations, uh, in, um, in our representational system and also the control of the judiciary. So it seems to me that we really won't know whether or not there's been a successful change in regimes that might lead to the promise of uh, uh, you know, the survival of American democracy till we know whether or not the Democrats are really serious about institutional reform. If uh, the Democrats, for example, simply take us out of the pandemic and the um, and economic contraction, but do nothing to fundamentally change our structures of representation, then I very much doubt that they will be successful in forming a new constitutional regime. Uh, simply because for the reasons that Daniel and Steve have offered, uh, the deck is stacked against them. And that's why I'm look, that's why I focused on the filibuster, not because I think the filibuster in itself is so important, but the filibuster unlocks the ability to do a bunch of other things. Uh, now, um, uh, Daniel asked about the judiciary. Why can't we just have term limits? And the answer is, well, uh, the Constitution uh, has a system of life tenure. Uh, it's, it's actually more complicated than that, but the bottom line is our Constitution guarantees life tenure to uh, the federal judiciary. And um, so either you amend the Constitution or else you have to engage in various kinds of workarounds. And by the way, the history of American democracy is full of workarounds that uh, don't require Article V amendment, but that are done in various other ways. So one of the reasons why the book has this discussion of the judiciary is that I need a workaround to uh, the, uh, the constitutional uh, provisions that require life tenure. Now, uh, as uh, comparative scholars compared to politics, they probably know that the United States is very much an outlier in, the, uh, in its judiciary rules that um, Germany, for example, does not have life tenure. Uh, uh, and most uh, uh, Western democracies don't have life tenure for their constitutional court. And we just, just a relic of our very old system. And it didn't matter too much for a very long time because um, justices would leave the court on the average every two years. So that in effect, we had a practical uh, equivalent of term limits, uh, but that changed in the 1970s, 1980s. And so now we have the, the specter of justices saying on the court for 30, 40 years at a time. Uh, so that's not, that's not good for the system. So you need some way of, of doing a, a, a constitutional workaround. <clears throat> but I, I wanna uh, close here by just emphasizing how much I am in agreement with them that the study of constitutional law now in this generation, the burden of this generation is studying constitutional reform, not just simply constitutional interpretation, which was the focus of the last 40 years or so. It has to be the question of constitutional reform, of design, uh, whether through the constitutional amendment process itself, 
or more likely through subconstitutional reforms that change our representational system and make it possible for our politics to get out of the terrible rut that it's found itself in. Uh, here, once again, I want to tip my hat to my dear friend Sandy Levinson, who was at least a decade ahead of me in recognizing that the wave of the future was constitutional design and constitutional reform. And I am a tardy student of his wisdom. But as you can see in this book, it has become increasingly clear to me that that is what constitutional scholars should focus on in the future. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so. Um, I think I'm going to uh, let the people who have questions uh, uh, send me, uh, put the question in brief in the Q&A box, but then when I call on you, I will allow you, uh, I, I will allow you uh, to speak. So, and also I want to encourage both uh, students and uh, faculty to uh, uh, to, to, a, to ask questions. Unfortunately, we've already got some of each. So I'm going to start. Uh, Professor Kate Silbell, would you ask your question? Sorry, the, um, it took me a second to find the unmute there. Um, yeah, my question is uh, what people on the panel, whether you guys have thoughts about the relationship between the sort of demographic background and profile um, of high pro profile constitutional scholars and other prominent constitutional voices such as the courts and the inability to break out of the regressive cycle we are in thinking about Jack just mentioning how we need a rejuvenation of uh, constitutional interpretation or uh, reform of democratic institutions. And I just wonder what, what people's thoughts are about um, representation in that project. Okay, I'll be happy to talk a little bit about that just to give Steve and Daniel a chance to collect their thoughts. Um, uh, so, I'll, so let me just say it in demographic terms, when you see the emergence of a new force in American politics, it's not just simply the same old folks with different ideas, it's new folks, uh, often from different parts of society um, with different experiences that are bringing them to bear in moments of reform. Um, you know, I can give you lots and lots of examples, but you know, take my favorite example, which is the, the Civil War period leading up to the first Reconstruction. Uh, let's hope, by the way, we're moving toward the third Reconstruction, but well, that's another conversation. If you think about uh, both the contributions of the first wave of American feminism in pushing a particular conception of liberty, the role of free Blacks in staging constitutional conventions, which are now being written about more, uh, in articulating a, a, a other constitutional conceptions of liberty and freedom, and also the role of folks who settled the Midwest and the South, uh, who were, uh, whose experience was not the East Coast, but rather uh, the politics created by uh, the um, Northwest Territory. And, it, and its creation into, uh, into states where slavery was always abolished. And so their experiences of what American ideals were were always different. And indeed, these folks always had the Bill of Rights applied to them because they were growing up in territories that became states that, that immediately had the same Bill of Rights. Their imagination was very different from the imagination of Southern planters on the one hand and from the imagination of financial elites, coastal elites on the East Coast. And they were creative in the way in which they had reimagined American constitutionalism. It was multiracial, it was both men and women, and it did have a very significant creative effect on, uh, on our constitution. Um, we, you know, there's more to say about it. Uh, and in fact, Robert uh, Sy's book uh, actually takes this idea and, and expands it much greater than what I've just said. But it's important to see that there is a possibility of hope here. There'll be a new generation, a new group of people with a different sense of what the constitution means to them and to the country who might be the source of renewal. Uh, Daniel or Steve, uh, do you have anything? Just uh, very quickly, I, I, uh, I know nothing about constitutional scholarship. I, I study political parties in Argentina. Um, but um, very quickly, I, I totally agree with one of Jack's final points, which is that if we are going to sort of get over 
the hump and uh, and reestablish our democracy is going to require thoroughgoing institutional reform. It's going to require that the Democrats carry out thoroughgoing institutional reform. And one thing he he didn't say, but just said in this in this comment, is that if, if we do uh, renovate and 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 reestablish, we consolidate our democracy. It's going to be a truly. It's going to have to be a truly multiracial democracy. And that is something that's really unprecedented, obviously in the United States, but I think worldwide. Uh, and it, it only makes sense uh, that those who think about how to, to, uh, to, to rethink our constitution for this 21st century multiracial democracy should be a, a, a much more diverse community. I, I would just add to this that, um, you know, I. You know, if the, if the diversity of constitutional scholars includes Steve, me, and Jack Balkan, we're, we're, in, uh, we're in bad shape. I mean, I think that's probably, you know, hopefully not. I mean, it is not representative it's, and, and ought not be representative. And I think actually that the point to be made here, you know, with the notion that constitutional changes only come on the back in some ways of social movements, I mean, with social movements pushing for this, there, this needs to be, this needs to kind of uh, resonate with broader segments of the American uh, population. And so it's, you know, it's one thing for me in a lecture to say the incentives of our constitutional system are, are set up to make the Republican party radicalized. So we need to change the incentives. I mean, that's, I, I think we need, a, we need a, a, a broader conversation that speaks to more people um, to make this a real, to make this a real thing. Otherwise it's a, it's a very narrow conversation. And so I think, I think that's an important part, not just about this, about who the scholars are who are working on this, but to, to whom uh, these themes resonate and why. And to, and to connect the, to connect very abstract sounding constitutional forms to people's everyday lived lives. I mean, I think that's really important as well. Uh, Joe Privé. I think your question is for Professor Levitsky, but if it's more general, that's fine too. Yep, thank you. Um, so I, I appreciate all the comments and I appreciate everyone for, or thank you everyone for being here. Um, and I appreciated the, um, the comments to sort of critique about a sort of uh, seeing things through a, a cyclical framework. Um, but I also, uh, I haven't read, um, the um, the book of the the latter um, authors. How, I haven't read the How Democracy Dies. Is what I'm trying to say. But um, I wonder if um, your critique or how does your critique factor in um, exogenous factors that have existed before? Uh, I understand that um, cyclical thinking may not appreciate um, the exogenous, um, but no doubt you know the exogenous has been a big factor in American constitutional history and development, um, and even, you know, you know really big um, external factors. Um, so how would, I guess the question would be, um, what, 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 what are you able to um, take from American history and how it has dealt with these sort of big radical exogenous factors before. Um, and the second question is, um, in terms of cynicism about institutions and conspiratorial, conspiratorial thinking about institutions, um, how can academia as an institution be a uh, part of the solution here? Thank you. So very quickly, we again, uh, you haven't missed that much, Joe, and having not read How Democracies Die. Um, we are, we're not constitutional scholars, and um, we actually, we're both comparativists. Daniel studies Europe, and I study Latin America. So what we primarily try to do, our, our sort of comparative advantage, so to speak, is to draw lessons from, uh, from other regime outcomes elsewhere in the world. Europe in the interwar period, Latin America in the 60s and 70s. We do reflect a, a fair amount on, on, on American history, but that's really not our strength. One thing we do do, and, and, um, and you know, our, our analysis is, it's not as smart as Jack's, but it's, it's really not that different. Our analysis of the problem today is not terribly different. Uh, and we recognize and, and argue in the book that the US system has, uh, has responded and at times responded quite effectively 
through a whole series of challenges. But one thing we point out looking back at US history, uh, and that we, again, that I think makes the contemporary period different is um, US's response, our, our political elite's responses, response to the polarization of the, of the reconstruction era and, and failed reconstruction um, was to essentially re exclude African Americans for nearly a century. Uh, one of the solutions, one of the keys to the, to, the, to the stability of our system in the 20th century was that we artificially restricted the American political community largely to, uh, to, to whites. And, um, and so that the, the democratization of the United States, the full democratization of the United States after the aborted effort during Reconstruction, it, beginning in the 1960s, this is new territory. And it's generated a, a, a hell of a reaction. Can I just add one thing to this? So, so the lesson of that then is that when you know when people you hear people calling for unity, you know, in the wake of January sixth, you know, sure in principle that sounds fine, and you know Joe Biden talks about it, and it's understandable why is a newly uh, a new president he's going to use this rhetoric. But what one has to be aware of is that this language becomes a cover for not addressing genuine problems or not abandoning a commitment to democracy. So, so when I make the case. Uh, in talks, you know, that these democratic reforms, abolishing the electoral college is necessary or getting rid of the filibuster, let's be more mod, take up Jack's suggestion, getting rid of the filibuster is necessary to allow majorities to speak. I'll often get the feedback from people saying, well, you know, you think that Republicans have been going crazy before, get rid of the filibuster, they'll really go crazy. And in a sense, what that is, is a kind of threat that if we don't confront, our, if, if you dare confront the inegalitarian features of our political system, that this is going to explode the system. And it's exactly that kind of thinking that I think allowed for uh, the resurrection, a restoration of kind of Jim Crow after the end of, of Reconstruction. And so, you know, I don't want, I want to be you know, clear. I'm not saying that people are advocating restricting the right to vote and so on, but we just have to be cautious because it's this, it's, it's that rhetoric can very easily be a veneer that papers over uh, real problems in our system. And, I, and, you know, my view is that we need to confront the problems rather than just ignoring them and using nice rhetoric. Yeah, I just want to pile on here and add that, that when I say you have to get rid of the filibuster, that's the first step. There's a, there's a John Lewis Voting Rights Act. You can't pass unless you get rid of the filibuster. There is HR1, which is basically re, uh, reshaping American politics, um, and that you can't pass that without, without getting rid of the filibuster. Court reform of the kind that I've suggested in this book, impossible without getting rid of the filibuster. The filibuster is the, is the key that unlocks all sorts of forms of reform. But it's these reforms that are important. The filibuster is just the entry point. You have to seriously rethink uh, how American politics is going to look in, in, in coming years. If we stick with the, the forms we have now, you are more likely to have exactly what uh, Stephen Daniel described, which is minoritarian government. Minoritarian government is a recipe for civil unrest uh, and the end of democracy. One more thing I want to say. Uh, the Ira Katz-Nelson point uh, that both of them have mentioned about the New Deal's, um, uh, uh, the New Deal's political system uh, being um, made possible by the exclusion of Blacks. It's really important to understand, here I'll get to argue this time it's different. Um, this is, I, I sent you guys a little essay on race and the cycles of constitutional time, but this is a point I make in that essay. The reason why that was possible was that by 1892, the Republican Party had essentially given up on protecting black civil rights as a means of uh, staying in power. Uh, that was the hope in the 1860s and early 1870s. That hope was soon dashed. And by 1892, they just give up. And so that means that the, neither of the two political parties has any interest in protecting the uh, civil rights of African-Americans. And that makes the, the rapprochement of whites in both parties much easier won't be so easy this time. I mean, it'll be impossible to have a rapprochement between white Americans when the Democratic Party looks the way it does and when it depends upon the votes of African Americans, Asian Americans, and Latinos. It's just not, it's just not in the cards. The Democratic Party is a multiracial party. The real question is whether the Republican Party will become a multiracial party. Um, uh, my prediction, this is me, the optimist, they will have no choice. They, and they're certainly on crutches right now, as you guys say, they just will have no choice. They will have to become a multiracial party. When that happens, certain things will be off the table in terms of what they can demand. That will create a space for new kinds of negotiations. But we are in a period of a, about a decade, it seems to me, 
in which they are going to resist with every fiber of their being their fate, which is to become, if they want to remain a viable political party in America, they have to be a multiracial party and they will resist. You can already see it in, uh, in today's papers, in the papers today, but they will, or else they'll have to give up. Well, you're right. They could just overthrow the government and institute a minoritarian dictatorship. But if, if we still have a democracy in 10 years, they will have to accept their fate. So the next two questions uh, from Professor Chris Robertson and Professor Sandy Levinson are on a similar theme of wondering why we're not talking about more fundamental constitutional change. Chris Robertson. Thanks, uh, Jim. That's right. Um, I was going to ask about, um, you know, why are we framing this around constitutional reform rather than constitutional replacement? You know, some of the structural features, as I've mentioned, like the Electoral College and the Senate, are, uh, are going to fundamentally distort politics uh, for this foreseeable future. And so I wonder if the extant constitution's amendment process is any more binding on us than were the Articles of Confederation's uh, requirement of a unanimous, uh, unanimous uh, agreement to, to change it, which the founders uh, promptly ignored. Um, and this is a point that the Jack, our colleague Jack Bierman has made in a, in a publication a few years ago. You know, once again, to give you guys something to think about, I'll just I'll I'll I'll, I'll plunge right in and just say uh, I you know I'm actually part of the the seminar that Sandy has organized on constitutional reform, uh, the Tomaski seminar, which is really one of the most interesting uh, intellectual experiences I've had uh, in recent years. Uh, but from a standpoint of practical politics, very different than the Tomaski seminar. Um, the the point is, it's very hard to. Uh, to have use Article Five or even the Constitutional Convention process, uh, unless you get a lot of people on board, because it's a, it's a pretty high bar. And similarly, uh, if you were to simply say, "Well, I'm going to scrap the Constitution and have a referendum," so we'll just hold a big referendum. Uh, well, that has its own problems. Um, who gets to say what's in the referendum and? Uh, and how is the referendum held? And what if a substantial proportion of the population doesn't accept the referendum as legitimate simply because they like their constitution? I mean, one of the, whether you call this a cul-de-sac or a feature, a bug or a feature of American constitutional culture is the enormous reverence Americans have for their constitution. Um, and so if a group of, and here I'll just use the term liberals were to insist, oh, let's have a referendum. And uh, the result of the referendum will be the new constitution. I dare say a substantial proportion of the American public would find that deeply illegitimate. Uh, and so getting out of the constitution in the same way that the Philadelphia convention got out of the Articles of Confederation will prove to be much more difficult. Uh, and it's also important to understand, uh, this is Mike Carmen's new book, um, uh, The Founders Coup, that the, uh, the move by the Philadelphia convention and their supporters was an elite driven exercise in hardball politics uh, uh, over the wishes of a significant percentage of the American public. I do not want to be aligned with that. And I certainly don't want uh, the progressive forces of American politics to be aligned with that. OK, um, so, uh, Professor Sandy Levinson, and then we'll have a student, Chris Wengard. Yeah, yeah my question obviously is along the lines of the previous one. Um, I'd really actually like to ask Steve Levitsky. Um, in 1999, Hugo Chavez in his inaugural address said, quote, I swear in front of my people that over this dying constitution, I will push forward the democratic transformations that are necessary so that the new republic will have an adequate Magna Carta for the times, unquote. So the question is that independently of what one thinks of the kind of president Chavez turned out to be, was he correct in 1999 in referring to the Venezuelan constitution as a dying constitution and supporting quite radical methods of transformation, such as the new constituent assembly. And so then the obvious question 
is whether we have to face the possibility that the US Constitution is a dying constitution, but at least at present, we have nobody in the leadership classes who's even willing to suggest that the constitution is a little bit sick, let alone dying. It's a great, great question. So <clears throat> I think you helped to make Jack's point with the with the last the last bit of your of your uh, comments, Andy, which is that um, the the politics of wholesale constitutional replacement, given the continued widespread legitimacy of the U.S. Constitution are, are, are very difficult. We're, we, we're politically not even close. And um, yeah, but let me leave it there. Uh, in, in, the, in the case of Venezuela, um, was it a dying constitution? I, I think that formally, institutionally, the, the 1958 Venezuela constitution worked fine. Uh, but the political regime and therefore the, the constitution that was attached to it had lost legitimacy had, uh, in a way that's uh, well beyond anything we are experiencing in the United States today. So Chavez was, a, was, was able to gain broad public consensus, which would presumably not happen here today, uh, behind constitutional, basically three quarters at least of Venezuelans were behind a, a, a thorough constitutional overhaul. Um, but the problem was not so much that first move by Chavez it was his, um, his, his solution, which was design electoral rules that would assure that his own party gained a, a super majority in the Constitutional Assembly and then unilaterally imposed a new constitution. That was a disaster, and that's part of the reason why Venezuela is where it is today, which is almost indistinguishable on most international uh, regime indices from Cuba. I think a better model, though, coming from South America is Chile. Chile also has a dying constitution. It, it's, it's, it's in the process of dying. It lost uh, legitimacy. This is Pinochet's constitution. Lost legitimacy over the, over the course of the years. Never had, never had broad legitimacy, but, but really fell in trouble in the last few years. Uh, Chileans had a, a, a referendum, decided to rewrite the constitution, but it is a pluralist process of constitutional reform with an open election, competitive election for constitutional assembly that will produce a fragmented body that will have to hammer out uh, with great difficulty, I'm sure, a new constitution. I think um, you know, th that, that's certainly a much more attractive model for me than, than the Venezuelan one. Uh, Chris Weingart. Thank you. So I have a, a somewhat cynical question, which is, can we trust the Democrats to play the part of hero in this narrative of renewal? And to, to, sort of a related question, to what extent um, have Democrats not only been complicit in the Reagan regime, but have actually been active participants in propelling it forward through neoliberal policies? And I'm kind of thinking of perhaps NAFTA or the 1994 crime bill under Clinton or um, perhaps Obama's use of, of drones. Thank you. That's why we call it a regime. Well, let me jet, let Jack answer that. Oh, I thought you were going to see. I, I thought you, we could we could benefit greatly from the distancing that comes from comparative study. I mean, I can give you a, a, an internalist account, but I think that I think the comparative approach is actually better here. But all right, so let me just explain. So, it uh, generally speaking, we assume that a new political regime will be produced by folks who are partly idealistic and partly self-interested and that they'll reshape the forms of politics, the party system, the representational systems in order to benefit themselves and entrench themselves. So one does not have to assume they're heroes in order for them to do that. They just have to want to basically dominate the agendas of politics. That's point number one. But the real problem for the Democrats is, is they may not have the ambition. Uh, they may lack the ambition to actually do that. I mean, this is, uh, I tear my hair out when I, uh, what's left of my hair when I uh, when I read about various democratic politicians who seem to be altogether too unambitious in, in what they think is possible in American politics. Second point is uh, there is no innocence in political regimes. I mean, this is part of what you were saying, Steve. Um, the Democrats were complicit uh, 
in the formation of the neoliberal uh, political economy that is characteristic of the Reagan regime. But I should also say that the, uh, the modern Republican Party, that is the Eisenhower wing of the modern Republican Party, was, uh, which is also includes Nixon, was totally complicit in the political economy of the New Deal civil rights era. And to their eternal shame, the Whig Party was complicit in the uh, compromises uh, of the 1840s and 50s that ultimately did the Whig Party in and led to the Civil War. So it's, I'm, I'm not shocked uh, to hear you uh, blame Democrats uh, for the excesses of the last 40 years. The real question is looking forward, which party has the best chance of renewing our institutions? It seems to me that would be the Democratic Party. I just, I just would add one, I agree with what Jack just said, <clears throat> but it, you know, it's much easier today to look back and, and identify the mistakes of the Democrats. But you know, reading history forward rather than backwards, we have to remember in the mid 1990s, had Bill Clinton not, the reason Bill Clinton moved to the middle, the reason Tony Blair moved to the middle, the, the reason Gerhard Schroeder moved to the middle or adopted neoliberal uh, economic policies is because all of these parties had been out of power for 12, you know, 15, 16 years. And so the sense was the way to get back into power was to move to where they thought the voters were. Maybe that was an incorrect calculation, but you know the electoral campaign of, of Michael Dukakis suggests a different story. And so you know the, the the real historical question to ask is: Had Bill Clinton not won in 1992, and you had had 10 more years of Republican governance in the 1990s, would we be in a better situation today or in a worse situation today? My guess is actually we'd probably be in a worse situation today. So I think the fact that you had Democrats and in, in, ideally in retrospect, you would have had you know Bernie Sanders running for president in 1996. We didn't have Bernie Sanders, he wouldn't have won. And so in some ways it's a kind of moot historical point. If I could just jump in very quickly. Uh, if, if Jack is a professional optimist, I can sometimes be a professional apologist for the Democratic party. And so another way of looking at lack of ambition is, um, is lack of capacity. And the Democrats, you have to remember that the Democrats are an extraordinarily heterogeneous party, right? We are a big, very heterogeneous, very diverse society with two parties. One of those parties has managed over the, due to the, the current realignment to be an incredibly homogeneous party, essentially of non-college educated white Christians. The Democrats are freaking everybody else. That is a very, very heterogeneous coalition, which makes uh, consensus difficult. And it makes, unfortunately, it makes action difficult. OK, well, thank you very much. We better wrap up. Uh, uh, thanks to uh, Steve Levitsky and Daniel Zablat, plus Jack. So we're going to take a 20-minute break now. And then we'll resume at um, 2.20 with Professor Gary Lawson and Professor Laura Weinrib with um, Professor Francisca Coleman as the moderator. So see you in a little bit. Thank you so much. Okay, so we're going to start the second panel. I think all of the panelists are here. So we have two panelists for this panel. Panel One is Professor Gary Lawson, who is the Philip S. Beck Professor of Law at Boston University. Our second panelist is Laura Weinreb, a professor of law at Harvard Law School, and the Suzanne Young Murray Professor at the Radcliffe Institute of Technology. So we'll let Professor Lawson go first, um, and then followed by Professor Weinreb. Thank you so much, and it's always an honor to comment on anything by Jack Falcon. Uh, welcome here. And um, I, I want to start with something that was uh, an internet rage a few years ago. The dress. Uh, people argued about whether this dress was blue and black, white and gold. I always thought it was blue and gold, uh, but you heard stories about friendships, relationships, even marriages breaking up over arguments about the color of this dress. How could you possibly not see what I'm seeing? What is wrong with you? And this is a familiar phenomenon. Uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein was obsessed with puzzle pictures like the duck rabbit puzzle picture. It's been a staple of psychology, neuroscience for quite some time. Um, there are auditory uh, equivalents of this, tactile equivalents. Not at all surprising. 
um, if people have different filters, different ways, they're observing exactly the same phenomenon, but the phenomena are being processed differently. With respect to simple sensory data, uh, it's not surprising that complex events that get filtered through conceptual frameworks, things we sometimes call ideologies or worldviews, might also be different. And given all of that, it's, it's, it's no surprise that when I read Jack's characteristically fascinating book, uh, I was having a lot of blue dress, white dress moments. That's, that's not news for me. I've spent my entire life uh, as an adult in the academy uh, seeing blue dresses where everyone around me seems to be describing white ones. Uh, but it did strike me that there, it was happening a lot. So, so after going through Jack's book, I, I did a little experiment. Um, I went through it a second time, just the first chapter, just the first 70 pages. And uh, what I was going to do is, is write down any time I came to a blue dress, white dress moment. N not things that I disagreed with Jack about. That's, that's, that's too easy. I could pick up things I've written and I would find things to disagree with. That's, that's nothing. Now, I was looking for WTF moments, things where it's one of us has to be living, at least one of us, has to be living in the shadow world of stranger things. And um, I filled up an entire page, had to go on to a second page. Um, that's what all these weird coded numbers here are. Those are the pages where I found something that I thought was a white dress, blue dress moment. And so I wanna reflect on, on and, I, and I'm sure that I'm not the only person who would, who would, who would read this book and, and, and have exactly the same experience. So I just want to reflect on what that phenomenon means for Jack's projects, and that's that's in plural. There's a descriptive project, there's a predictive project, and there's a normative project underlying here. I don't have time to differentiate among them, so I want to, I want to try to look at this from a fairly high level. Put a different way, uh, what is it uh, that requires explanation in the world? I mean, one of Jack's central concepts is the idea of constitutional rot, which of course presupposes a baseline of constitutional health uh, that can be contrasted with. Uh, so what is it that we're actually explaining? Are we explaining a process of constitutional rot or is the thing that requires explanation uh, the absence of what Jack describes for perhaps relatively brief periods of time? Framed that way, these are questions for political scientists, political theorists, sociologists, maybe psychologists. I am none of those things. Uh, I am barely a lawyer. Uh, so if that's really what's involved here, uh, I'm done. Uh, we're finished. Bye. Thank you all for listening. Uh, but it just so happens that there are people who are political scientists, political theorists, and so forth, who have thought about these sorts of questions. And indeed, they thought about them for a very long time. They thought about them in the 18th century and long before the 18th century. As Jack points out, people in classical times thought very carefully about what it is that makes republics possible and successful. And uh, not only had the framers read Aristotle and Polybius, they had also read the celebrated Montesquieu. And one of the precepts of the celebrated Montesquieu was, if, if you wanna have a republic, it's gotta be really, really small. Now, conventional wisdom says that James Madison decisively refuted Montesquieu, Aristotle, and Polybius in the famous Federalist 10. Um, maybe. That's for the political scientists and the political philosophers to argue about, not for me. Um, I'm not so sure. Um, and um, th there are two dimensions to Montesquieu's theory for a successful republic. It's supposed to be small geographically and in terms of population and homogeneous. Now, eight years ago, I had a conference on constitutional dysfunction I took on the size issue, suggesting no stronger word than that, just suggesting that maybe the United States uh, exceeded the optimal size for a nation. Uh, 
could very well have exceeded the optimal size for a nation in the 18th century. Um, much more interesting question whether it exceeds the optimal size for a nation today. So what I want to do in a few minutes at this event is take a look at the other half of Montesquieu's prescription, uh, homogeneity, uh, which of course poses immediately two closely related questions. Uh, homogeneity of what? And uh, what would it mean for a republic to be healthy rather than rotten? So if homogeneity is a precondition for a healthy republic, in Montesquieu's eyes, well, what, what would be the marks of a healthy republic? What would make it healthy? Uh, and that's a particularly profound uh, uh, question in this context. Uh, Jack has a definition of a republic for us, uh, a joint enterprise by citizens and their representatives to pursue and promote the public good. And stemming out of that, uh, we can see his conception of constitutional rot, uh, which we could reverse engineer to identify certain preconditions in fact, for constitutional health. Uh, the question for the day is whether there's something even more fundamentally basic than that, a precondition for Republican health or indeed even for Republican existence, some kind of homogeneity, at least with respect to whether the dress is blue or white. And in the context of the United States, that's a very interesting question. Uh, because if you actually just look at the United States without any preconceptions, without thinking of it from the inside, it, it's not something that makes a lot of sense. And there were a whole lot of folks in the 18th century who didn't think it made a lot of sense then. Um, if homogeneity is what you're looking for, you had independent nations purporting to come together. They differed across religion, they differed across culture, they differed across something as fundamentally basic as whether or not people could own other people. Uh, and there were a whole lot of folks who thought that wasn't possible, and a lot of people opposed uh, the consolidation of those nations into a single nation. Uh, throw on to that all the events that happened since. There's been a lot of stuff added to the United States since that time. By and large, possible exception of Texas, which is a weird story in itself. Um, this was not people seeking to join the United States of their own accord. These were acquisitions, some by purchase, some by war, some by threat of war. The result is that the current geographical extent of the United States is something of a Frankenstein's monster a patchwork. Very hard to see what it what it is that would put or glue those things together. Well, the traditional answer to that has always been that there's some core set of ideas that, that America is unique and that it's not stitched together by geography or culture or any of those things. It's stitched together by ideas. Um, is it really? Uh, and that's where the blue dress, white dress problem comes in. Uh, there are any number of possible candidates out there for the fundamental ideas that define what it is to be the United States. The thing is, they generate blue dress, white dress level disagreements. Um, those disagreements are quite fundamental. Uh, they go to the, to the very nature of what law is, what law is for, what social arrangements are for. Um, what do we do with that? Um, there's an episode of the original, real, only true Star Trek uh, that had a bunch of uh, gangs modeled after the Chicago gangs of the 1920s, essentially fighting over turf and resources. Um, it's nice to think about social organization in terms other than that. Once you've got things reduced to blue dress, white dress disagreements, is that really so? Is that really so? I am not here to answer any of those questions. I'm just here to pose them. It seems to me that a precondition for any of Jack's projects, descriptive, predictive, or normative, is to put forward some conception of the common or public good that doesn't run head first into a blue dress, white dress problem. And, and, and I'll end by posing this question. Why, 
what's the end game here? The end game is to hold the United States together as a single distinctive entity. Why? What, 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 is, what, is, what, is the, what is the what is the purpose of that? Who does that benefit? Or is that itself a blue dress, white dress problem? Uh, so no doubt, uh, James Madison was a smart guy and the institutions that he and others constructed were, were actually quite, quite remarkable. But there are lots of smart guys out there, uh, including the people that folks like Nathaniel Gorham were reading. Uh, and they had real doubts that this was an enterprise that could be carried out. So, so the question that I will that I will pose here, and again, I, I pose it as a question, as as a as a barely lawyer, not as a, as a as a as a theorist of any kind. Um, does does the United States make sense? And if the United States doesn't make sense, um, what? What then? Dot dot dot. Okay, let's do it. Thank you so much, Professor Lawson. We're going to hear now from Professor Weinreb. Okay, um, I'm thrilled to be a part of this discussion today of um, Jack Balkin's illuminating new book. And like the other panelists, I learned a tremendous amount from reading this. It's given me a lot to think about with respect to the future of our democracy. And at the end uh, of my comments, I'm gonna take a couple of minutes to reflect on some of the possibilities that Jack identifies. Um, but as the only legal historian on the roster today, I feel compelled to focus primarily on Balkan's principal historical claims, uh, together with his central claim about the development of constitutional law and judicial review. So I'm going to turn first briefly to uh, the claim that historical change operates cyclically and that we're currently living through a uh, second gilded age on the, on the cusp of a second progressive era. Uh, and then I'm gonna take up the related claim that courts have served as a source of constitutional renewal during some periods, including the mid 20th century, uh, but that they don't hold the answer now. By way of preview, uh, I agree with Jack that courts do not hold the answer to our current predicaments. Uh, but I want to suggest that the Caroline products regime that Balkan describes did not arise as a solution to economic inequality and to an unrepresentative republic in a period of declining political polarization. On the contrary, I want to say if history appears to be moving in cycles, if we appear to be back in the Gilded Age, well, it may just be because the New Deal settlement itself staved off more lasting and meaningful change. So first, on cycles of historical time. Um, Jack opens by noting that the two dominant theories of constitutional interpretation in the United States, originalism and living constitutionalism, involve linear understandings of time. Uh, and of course, progress narratives fit comfortably within this linear model, and so do declension narratives insofar as we're straying away from a golden age or foundational moment. Now, so far we're on relatively familiar terrain. So this rejection of functionalist or teleological accounts of legal history has been, uh, I think, part and parcel of the turn to, to critical legal history over the last several decades. But when it comes to the alternative Jack offers, we're in for a bit of surprise. Um, Balkan offers not primarily contingency, not breaks and discontinuities. Um, this is no more a stochastic theory of time than a linear one. What we get instead, of course, is cycles. Now, Jack does reject a strongly deterministic account. Uh, that's a point he reiterated today. But he also offers more than mere resonances between historical periods. Uh, the assumption here is that the convergence or divergence of these cycles 
will produce predictable results, what he described in the last panel as regularities. If we look to a previous period in which the three cycles aligned as they do today, we will find circumstances very much like ours, and we can assume that their subsequent trajectories will also produce, uh, will also predict our own. Now, I don't want to jeopardize my historian's credentials here, uh, but I actually share Jack's sense that there are strong resonances between the first Gilded Age and our present moment, uh, even if there are also pronounced differences. I'm fully convinced uh, by Jack's analysis that we're in a period of constitutional rot. I hope he's right that we're witnessing the last gaps, uh, gasps of the, the Reagan era political regime. But I can't help feeling that partisan political polarization was less central a causal factor in the rise of the Gilded Age and that depolarization was less central uh, a factor in its unraveling than Jack's account suggests. So the Gilded Age uh, was indeed marked by staggering economic inequality and by political polarization, as Jack notes, but it also coincided with the emergence of class consciousness in a real way in the United States for the first time. Class conflict was new, and it bore an uneasy relation to past sources of struggle, including racial subordination and uh, resistance. In short, the fundamental problems that activists, legislators, and judges of that period were grappling with were new ones. And the solutions they tried were also new, or at least new to the United States. So what does all of this have to do with Jack's cycles? Well, first, Jack tells us that one of the most important causes of polarization is income inequality. He says, during the Gilded Age, political polarization stayed high because of increasing income inequality. Uh, and that's because uh, income inequality makes it easier for politicians and political activists to polarize politics. But while that may be true under some circumstances, maybe uh, including the Reagan era, it's not obvious why it would always be the case. And uh, income inequality in the United States was extremely high at the turn of the 20th century, peaking in 1916, then dipping slightly until 1923, then rising sharply again until the stock market crash. Now, during that same period, party polarization in the United States dropped sharply. Jack does acknowledge that when income inequality becomes too high, it can lead to depolarization. But it's not clear from his account how high is too high or when the switch is flipped. Uh, in practice, the decline in polarization in the United States began almost as soon as the Republican Party gave up on Reconstruction and African American rights. Uh, party bases began to scramble in the late 19th century, leading by 1912 to the most successful non-major party candidate presidential runs in US history. Partisan realignment was in full swing. And I'm reluctant to make claims about causation here, but the fact that Socialist Party candidate Eugene Debs received 6% of the vote in 1912 uh, might be taken as evidence that income inequality reduces party polarization rather than the other way around. Jack's account of the relationship between immigration and the public appetite for redistribution, uh, I think is even harder to square with progressive era trends. So uh, Jack explains that high rates of immigration bolster the median income of voters relative to average household income, which reduces the electoral pressure for redistribution. But immigration to the United States skyrocketed between 1897 uh, and 1907. It remained near its height until the beginning of World War I. And those were, of course, the years of the most notable redistributive progressive reforms, culminating with the 16th Amendment and the Progressive Income Tax, which was ratified in uh, 1913. Okay, so I have some quibbles with Jack when it comes to progressive era income, income inequality and its solutions, and in particular, to the causal role of polarization. So what about the relationship between polarization and judicial review? This is Jack's chapter nine. Um, it's here that I think I part ways from Jack most sharply. 
Uh, and uh, I expect that Jack will attribute this departure to generational change within the legal academy uh, to the fact that I went to law school when the Rehnquist court was in full swing. Uh, but I regard the fundamental conservatism of the early 20th century judiciary not as a holdover from the earlier regime during which the judges were appointed, but rather as a structural feature of the judiciary as an institution. And I regard Lochner era judicial review not only as an inadequate cure for constitutional rot or even an exacerbating element in our current period of constitutional rot, but as a significant factor, a precipitating factor at its inception. Um, certainly, if you were to ask progressive era thinkers to pinpoint the source of constitutional rot, that's the cause many of them would have identified. Now, needless to say, uh, the notion that courts play this role, this inherently conservative role, as a check on progressive reform has a long legacy. It was richly developed during the progressive era. Uh, and these critiques ran the gamut from accusations of graft to the effects of peer groups or legal education to sophisticated accounts of the conservative tendencies of what we would now call classical legal thought. Um, like Jack, progressive era thinkers thought that life tenure was part of the problem. Uh, and that's why they endorsed the, the popular recall of judges. But the reality is that the judges who impeded reform during the progressive era and New Deal were not regarded as especially retrograde. In fact, uh, one well-known labor lawyer uh, explicitly channeling William Graham Sumner uh, expressed relief in 1926 that the judges, as he put it, were behindhand that they were throwbacks to the pre-war period. So even as polarization declined, uh, they thought that newly appointed judges would be more obstructionist, more antagonistic to workers' rights, not less so. Okay, at the beginning of chapter 10, uh, Jack nicely summarizes the various ways in which the judiciary can operate to check economic redistribution. But when push comes to shove, uh, I think he treats the law essentially as superstructure. The courts are not constitutive of the constitutional regime uh, that he describes in any real sense. The other cycles are what's driving change. So how does this play out with respect to judicial review? Um, Jack sees Caroline Products footnote four as a nice way to shore up the constitutional order during periods of low polarization. In a depolarized world, courts can set down the basic rules of fair political combat, he says, with protection for political mobilization and minority rights, leaving everything else to be worked out in political struggle. Now, of course, that approach, um, which uh, is often uh, described as the New Deal settlement, was never perfect. And there's a fair amount of agreement among historians and legal scholars that judicial enforcement of the rights contained within uh, footnote four was almost always feeble and selective, that the courts almost always found ways to temper redistribution. Still, Jack describes the middle of the 20th century as a period of relative constitutional consensus. And because that consensus was driven by depolarization, as opposed to a particularly commanding constitutional theory, the New Deal settlement uh, as he describes it, was bound to unravel uh, eventually. Okay, so I know I am running up against the end of my time, but I just want to take a minute here to push a bit on the presumption that the problem with the New Deal settlement was at bottom its limited utility in an era of economic inequality and polarization. Uh, the problem, in my view, was not just that the New Deal settlement couldn't deal with these developments. Uh, I want to suggest that the New Deal settlement may have entrenched economic inequality and in the long run produced constitutional rot. Um, and uh, I'll develop these arguments uh, in much greater length in the paper, but for now, let me just very quickly flag three ways in which this may be true. So the first is that the New Deal settlement preserved a strong form of counter-majoritarian constitutionalism in the United States. And in doing so, it cut off a national conversation about other options. So we have to recognize here that the Caroline Products approach 
was not uh, uh, an alternative to the continuation of Lochner era legalism, but rather to sweeping institutional reform of the judiciary. Uh, and as I've written elsewhere, it was not a spontaneous judicial innovation. Rather, it was the product of two decades of social movement activism, including an awkward alliance between state skeptical labor radicals and their anti-regulation conservative counterparts. Um, conservatives began to, I, I, I will. I'm, so conservatives began to celebrate the judicial enforcement of personal rights uh, quite self-consciously as a means of preserving judicial review. Uh, and they maintained their new commitment even after the Supreme Court's switch in time uh, in 1937, in part because they were very anxious about some of the very sophisticated and very popular court curving proposals that were on the table. I uh, won't be able to describe those, uh, but happy to take them up uh, in the Q&A. Uh, the, the result is once, so uh, basically once the New Deal settlement took root, proposals to rethink judicial review were to use Jack's term uh, off the wall. Um, I won't talk about the other two points, um, but let me just say uh, that uh, I think that uh, the New Deal settlement ended up serving to uh, mask disagreement about, uh, to essentially to produce a false sense of consensus and reconciliation, mask disagreement about uh, underlying goals, that it may have served to drain energy from social movements rather than to empower them. Uh, and finally, uh, I think uh, served in, in large part to legitimate the status quo. I think that the New Deal settlement led us to see broad-based popular consensus where none existed outside elite circles, uh, which uh, I think is true of the Warren court period. Okay, so uh, I will wrap up there. Uh, I will say in conclusion that I think some of those earlier reforms, if we're to look back at history, are worth a hard look today. Some of them uh, served, would serve, I think, potentially to constrain judicial reviews in review in ways uh, that would produce uh, constitutional renewal rather than constitutional rot, uh, and would uh, perhaps most importantly allow meaningful reform on the kinds of things that Jack suggests in his last chapter uh, with respect to making government, making American democracy more inclusive and more representative with the goal of reducing social and economic inequality. Uh, sorry for that time. time, I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, before we turn to Professor Balkan for his response, I just wanna make a note about questions. If you have questions, please type them in the Q&A box and I will pose them to the panelists after Professor Balkan's response. We will now hear from Professor Balkan. Um, so thank you for these very different presentations, but my goal is to try to, uh, to put them all together. Okay, I'll start it backwards with Laura and then work my way up uh, to uh, uh, Gary's secessionist temperament. Uh, uh, so uh, they're both revolutionaries, you know, both of them in their own way, Laura and Gary, just different kinds of revolution. Uh, so I want to start out, actually, I'm mostly going to agree with Laura. So there you are. So I should have seated you my time, Laura and let you talk more about the New Deal settlement, because uh, I'm going to agree with you. Um, so you know, because uh, you're an historian, you know that there's this period of consensus history in the 40s and 50s. And you also know that the basic problem with consensus history of the 40s and 50s was that it was this imagined consensus, and it didn't actually reflect what was going on. And this is what the critique critiques of consensus history have been offering ever since. And you know, and that's that's right to me. I'm interested as an intellectual formation in uh, America during this period, not because there really was a consensus, but because of uh, groups of educated elites and political actors who felt that they had to insist there was a consensus, uh, right? So in other words, the one way of understanding the New Deal settlement from the 30s after the 50s um, is that it's this imagined consensus by the ruling elites of the United States at who enforce that ruling consensus in various ways. So you're spot on in the way you talk about it. I think that's exactly right. Um, it's also true that uh, as many uh, uh, historians have pointed out that what the New Deal does was take 
was, was it's like a safety valve, uh, as Vince Bozzi would say. It basically takes more dangerous changes off the table and preserves a particular form of democratic capitalism. Uh, so in this sense, FDR is a hero to capitalists because what he does is he preserves capitalism and, and he lets labor unions in only under certain conditions. And as we see later, the Democratic Party's relationship to labor unions changes in the 40s and 50s. So that, that sounds right to me too. Um, and um, it's uh, the next thing I want to say is that uh, I think you're also right. And I, it, you're taking a stronger position than I do in the book, but I will support your stronger position that one should never look to the judiciary as a source of constitutional renewal. Uh, I say in the book that you shouldn't expect the judiciary to serve that function now. I will say yes, and in general, you shouldn't. Why? Because the judiciary is a fundamentally conservative institution in, in a democracy. I mean, that's why you become a judge. That's what the culture of judiciary is. It's largely conservative. A conservative, not necessarily politically conservative, but conservative in conserving whatever the, uh, the, the, the forces at the time are. Um, and then, so what do we do about the, the middle of the 20th century and the judiciary then? Well, the answer is very simple, that the judiciary then is working in cooperation with various movements in society, with the labor movement, later with the civil rights movement, uh, later with the movements for women's equality and gay rights and such, uh, so forth and so on. That, it's, that the best way to understand its success is as a, as in cooperation with other things that are going on in politics, instead of seeing it as the cause or the central motor of uh, progressive reform, we should understand it's a cooperative enterprise. And that's actually, I think, a better way of understanding the way that the justices during this period thought of themselves. They don't understand themselves as driving the train, they understand themselves cooperating uh, with other. And then, of course, once, um, once you get the counter mobilizations that occur in the 1970s, uh, new judiciary, uh, new phone, who dis, uh, you know, you just get a, a different form of politics. Uh, so that leads to the stronger claim that you're making, which is you should never look to the judiciary as a source of constitutional renewal. It's never going to get you out of constitutional rot. Instead, you should look to mobilizations and political processes to the extent that they can allow you to do it. That sounds right. Um, then you make a bunch of, I think, really very telling criticisms of my views about polarization, income inequality, and immigration, which I won't repeat here just to say that I think that, uh, that I think you've, you've got an issue, is the causal arrow going in the wrong direction? That is to say, the rate of immigration slows and the rate of immigration basically stops right around the beginning of World War II, but how do you explain all the stuff that happens between 1896 and, um, and 1914? And that isn't because the rate of immigration slows, that must be due to something else. Um, I mean, I do have a story there, but it's not the greatest story. Uh, the story is that the, that basically the um, the forces of uh, the folks that are trying to basically keep income inequality high overplay their hand uh, right around the uh, 1890s. They just overplay the hand and the Supreme Court, which is a lead institution, strikes down the income tax. There's enormous outrage at Pollock. And what happens is you start to get, and people are very upset about the corruption in both parties, and you start to get uh, movements for reform that cross party lines. And as you know, as you pointed out, you also get the beginnings of socialist movement in the United States and Debs. So I think that story is different than a story about immigration. It's really a story about people just uh, can be complete, completely losing trust in uh, elites in society and just uh, rebelling in certain ways. I mean, not, uh, and you do have violence during this period, as you know, you have strikes and, and you have uh, lots of, of violence. So I think that's a better, I think it's a useful corrective to some of the stuff I say in the book. So that's very helpful. Uh, now I have to back up and see what else have I, have I missed. Oh, um, so when we think about cycles, um, the only thing I want to say here, and I, I take your points uh, to heart, is that when I think about cycles, I'm thinking about what is the relationship between structure and agency, an old chestnut in social science thought. So um, if structure and agency work in certain kinds of ways, they can produce the appearance of resonances and cycles, but it's not that the cycles are actually causing anything. What's really, what really matters is how structure uh, limits agency and how agent, uh, waves of agency remake structure. That would be the thing we would wanna look at. Of course, that huge literature is just thinking about that problem in history. Um, and then cycles are the, are the phenomenon that are produced by this. And the cycles aren't the causal element. They're just, uh, 
with the way we describe the events later on. So a descriptive account of cycles is better than a causal account of cycles, it seems to me. Last thing I want to say is I tend to agree with you that uh, courts tend to reinforce income inequality and uh, block forms of redistributional change. Uh, they, 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 they only do that for a living. Uh, but if you wanted me to tell you why I think you get um, a significant increases in income inequality and wealth inequality in the period from say 1975 to 2015, I wouldn't put the courts as the central causal player. I would put Congress and the administrative agencies as a central causal player uh, because what they do, well, this is uh, Jacob Hacker's work. Uh, Jacob Hacker's work is all about the political economy of this period. And I think he shows very convincingly that it's the administrative state and Congress that are basically doing most of the work uh, in uh, uh, creating opportunities for income inequality. Also, uh, this is my other line of, of work, which is um, uh, uh, tech policy. Uh, the reason why these tech uh, companies get so big uh, and why they swallow up all their potential competitors and why they bestride the world like a colossus is because of a bunch of regulatory decisions made in this crucial period between 1980 and about uh, 2005 that essentially allow them to have the kind of business models they have. And so now what we have are these enormous companies that not only uh, affect American politics, but politics around the world. So this is just me agreeing with you in a slightly different way. Now, uh, so uh, now let's talk about, let's talk about the true revolutionary in today's conference, and that's Gary Lawson. So uh, the, the question that you're, you know, uh, it seems like Sandy should be on this panel. So Sandy's two big ideas are, we need a new constitution and maybe we should break up the United States. Uh, so uh, here's the puzzle, or rather here's the thing to think about. A Republican, uh, system of government does not treat its populations as simply exogenous. It treats, to go back to our earlier discussion, it treats populations as being produced through the form of government that it has. So in a successful republic, groups of folks that don't think they have anything in common or don't see why they have, should have anything in common come to see each other as having something in common, which then strengthens the republic. Okay. So at the beginning of the country, uh, this is Jay's Federalist II, Jay lies about the fact that you have a homogeneous population, but of course you don't have a homogeneous population. But what the early Federalists do is they, and also the Jeffersonians, so let's not leave them out, is they create a republic through a whole series of decisions to create a common culture and common institutions and focus on particular ways of making people think they have a common stake in the success of the republic. So instead of starting with the idea that we have very highly differentiated populations, why are they in the same place, right? Instead ask how could, the, how could forms of sociality and governance help allow people who are different, always different, to imagine they have a common stake in something. And here's a way then of understanding uh, your point, Gary. So this, I hope this will bridge the blue dress, uh, gold dress uh, problem. You could understand our current, you could ask why now are you arguing for secession? Would one argue for secession? Haven't we had huge waves of immigrants in the United States? Haven't we had uh, amazing heterogeneity in our populations? Why now, after all the stuff we've gone through, would it be the case that it's time to think about breaking up the United States, right? That's one way of asking the question. Since we, I could do the historian's trick and show you other periods in which you have the same problem. In fact, I was thinking about the debate over hyphenated Americans uh, at the beginning of the 20th century in which people say, well, you know, can we have Americans that are hyphenated Americans, Italian Americans, Irish Americans, Jewish Americans, is that possible? And that this debate goes away eventually. It goes away because of what happens later on. The same thing you could say today. So I want to suggest that there's been a failure. There's been a failure in Republican government, not a failure in making income inequality better, not a failure in uh, this, but a failure in the constant reproduction of a common sense, a common stake in democracy that is actually necessary for a democracies to thrive. When people complain about the last 40 years, they complain about a lot of other things, but I think they should complain about this, that, that the reason why the society breaks apart is because uh, politicians let it break apart. 
and sometimes encouraged it to break apart and made hay out of short-term gains for letting it break apart. And I'm not pointing fingers at anyone except for Newt Gingrich. Excuse me, I'm sorry, I said it. I, I, I'm just saying that there, if you want a republic, you have to keep at it because otherwise the centrifugal force of democracy and change and fortuna will produce ever greater reasons to break up. And so what you're identifying now, Gary, you're not merely a lawyer, you're also a diagnostician of the first rank, is you're noticing the wreckage of a failure of Republican government over a 40 year period uh, in which the seed corn, I hear I'm mixing metaphors, the seed corn of Republicanism was eaten up for short term gain in which the creation of a common Americanism was undermined and destroyed. We could blame it on China. We could blame it on elites. There are a lot of people we can blame it for, but that's where we are now. And the only way to keep America together would be to try to reinvest in a Republican culture with a small r. That's gonna be very hard to do for the reasons you explained in your presentation. Thank you. Okay, We're, we have one question and um, from uh, Jim, and then we have a second question from Christopher uh, Robertson. So we're gonna start off with a question from, from Jim. Francesca, did you call on me? Yes. Okay, sorry. I was expecting you to call on Chris Robertson. Okay, sorry. Um, so I want to pick up on some of the things that Jack was just saying and put a question to Gary. Um, you used uh, the language of breakup. Um, now, one can imagine a number of different mechanisms why there would be some kind of breakup of the United States of America. Uh, one approach might be to say, well, this idea of the federal union we have is just too large for all the reasons you gave. And so we might adopt a strong version of federalism, which is a, a structure for processing disagreement and diversity, and move to something like a, 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 a confederation that just unites for certain purposes like national defense. Or you might also um, just uh, 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 take the country and divide it into the United Red States of America and, and the United Blue States of America. And they would be non-contiguous uh, uh, United uh, uh, States. Uh, and maybe there could be some way to unite even there for defense. And another mechanism might be uh, a, a very permissive attitude towards secession or even, enc even encouragement of, uh, 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 of secession uh, to let people uh, of their own accord break up and go their own way. Now, do you think of, are you thinking of any of these kinds of things? Or are you just rejecting the aspiration to the, to the common good and the aspiration to a governable United States of America that's 330 million people and, that's, uh, and that, that is rotting away and so polarized as this? this? This will sound weaselly, but it's not meant to be. Um, I, I'm actually not saying any of those things. I'm just posing the questions. Uh, there, are, there are two things I know, and there's one big thing I don't know. Thing number one that I think I know, at least, uh, I do think as a matter of positive law, secession is unconstitutional. I'm not, I've, I've actually said that in print. Uh, I go with the key Lamar on that one. As a matter of positive law, that's, that's, a, that's an empirical fact. That doesn't tell you whether it's a good idea, bad idea, but I do think it's unconstitutional. Uh, uh, Abraham Lincoln was right about that. Second thing, I, I'm confident I know. It's not that I dislike the national government, but like state and local governments. I dislike all of them. Uh, uh, that's that, that I'm quite sure of. Which leads to the third thing, which I don't know. 
and that is um, what would make for a better world by my criteria of what is better. Here, economists warn us about the grass is greener fallacy, assuming that because things really suck, therefore, if you make a change, it must be better. Well, no, it doesn't follow at all. It's quite possible to go from really bad to horribly, awfully bad. Uh, do I have any considered view on whether just as a matter of policy, it would be a better world if the United States did what the Soviet Union did and, you know, with without a lot of, you know, wars and fighting just sort of dissolved. It's just one day it's there and the next day. That I have absolutely no idea. Uh, I, I don't even know how to go about thinking about that sort of question. Uh, so I don't. I mean, Try not to spend my time thinking about questions that I'm not going to have any way to answer. Here, here's the one thing that I do uh, want want to get out about this, and it, 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 it to some extent uh, follows from what uh, from what Professor Weinrib and and and, and Jack uh, said. But it was really a question that I, I think I would have asked of um, Daniel Ziblad if I if I wasn't a panelist. One difference between the United States government today and the United States government in 1788 or 1868 or 1938 or any other time, it's a whole lot bigger. Just, just there's a whole lot more of it. It's got its schnoz in a whole lot more things today than, than, than it did in the Gilded Age or the Civil War era or the founding era or any of those things. So, as a possible partial answer to Jack's question of why now, because the stakes are a lot higher now. Uh, I, I know I know Daniel Ziblatt was talking about lowering the stakes by by tweaking methods of judicial selection. You really want to lower the stakes? There's got to be a whole lot less on the line every time there's one of these elections as long as the size and scope of government continues to increase, and there's no, I don't know of anyone who's plausibly predicting that that trend is going to go down rather than up, I, I certainly wouldn't, wouldn't predict that. Um, of, of course, the, the stakes are, are, are going to be high. So uh, they're, they're a lot higher now. There's, there's more, more stuff on the table. I mean, in 1788, it probably mattered more who was mayor of your town than who was president of the United States. And that's just obviously not true today. So whoever is responsible for the nationalization of politics that Jack talks about, uh, and, and I understand why he, he has Newt Gingrich in there. Uh, the contract with America was a, was a big deal. Uh, a symptom perhaps, rather than a cause, but, 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 but a big deal. But just as, a, as an observation of why, why now? Because there's more going on now uh, would, would be one possible simple, simple, simple question. Uh, but no, I don't, I, don't, I don't sit around thinking about uh, uh, how, to, how to redraw the, the, the political map. Um, I sit around with a cat in my lap writing academic articles. Uh, and, and I really don't have any ambitions beyond that. I honestly, genuinely, truly, truly don't. Uh, that may sound boring, but I always thought of myself as a boring person. I thought, Gary, you were a curator of uh, rock and roll songs. At least I well, can tell from your presentation. <laughs> well, there there was, there was, there was some, there was some pop in there, a uh, little bit of soul. Uh, but yeah, pri primarily classic rock. So we have we have another question from Christopher Robertson, which is about um, secession. So you want to ask your and ask your question? Yeah, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask uh, Professor Balkan if his view about secession would be the same if if Trump had successfully overturned the results of the twenty twenty election and was now, you know, posing as president, or if some such lawless behavior was happening. You know, in 2024, I mean, with, and I guess what I'm, what I'm asking all the panelists, really, you know, some of the constitutional discussions, the constitutional history is on decade or century long time frames, but there's a sense in which sometimes history, right, compresses to a, to a week <laughs> or a month. Uh, and I wondered if you had thoughts about what those crises might actually look like and what the, 
uh, you know, what ch chess pieces will be on the board if, if there is a, a constitutional crisis that gets a little further than it did this January. Well, I should just say, uh, Chris, that I was, we did a symposium on two books on secession, on balkanization several months ago. Uh, and I wrote a very long essay telling you what I think about secession uh, in the United States, which is I'm against it. Uh, and I'm against it whether Trump wins in uh, 2020 or 2024. And there's a very simple reason, which is secession is not about, simply about the question of uh, relationships of Americans to each other. It's about the relationship with the rest of the world, the United States. Uh, and um, also, it's very hard to have secession in a nuclear power. Uh, you can't have secession in nuclear power unless all the other uh, states in the uh, uh, powerful states gang up and make sure that nuclear weapons are disposed of in an appropriate way. That was the key to the breakup of the Soviet Union in 1991. Well, the United States is the most powerful nation on earth, and it's also the biggest nuclear power. And if you think that you would just let uh, anybody have access to our nuclear uh, arsenal, I got another thing to tell you. So secession has to be off the table unless you want the Chinese and the Russians uh, to distribute uh, the nuclear arms to the different uh, factions in the United States. That would be highly amusing uh, for me to, to contemplate. So my, uh, my concerns about uh, secession are very similar actually to Lincoln's. Lincoln was opposed to secession not only because of the constitution forbade it, but also for geostrategic reasons. I mean, that, that was one of Lincoln's arguments against secession. And that's my argument against secession in the United States today. Okay, we also have a question um, from Linda McLean, and then we have a question from Joe Pride. Um, well, after what Gary said, I think he may not have an answer to my question, but maybe I'll pose it to the other panelists as well. Um, which would be, if you were to try to take the blue dress, white dress dilemma and apply it to the polarized United States, what are the two pictures of the dress? And maybe Gary, you don't really have a big picture answer to that, but I guess this relates to the question of whether um, a republic is possible, not just when there's no homogeneity, but when people so sharply differ even about the outcome of the 2020 election. And so I don't know if you have a big picture vision, Gary, of what the two dresses are or the more than two dresses are, or if the other panelists have a thought. I mean, I think I know Jack's view on this, but maybe what Professor Weinberg thinks about the, the degree of polarization over visions of America and, and what if that's sort of unprecedented. I mean, what I, what I put on a slide, and I, I, I didn't leave them up for very long, was my, my door number one, door number two. Um, my, my door number one was uh, the government exists primarily to help me stop people from taking my stuff and telling me what to do. Door number two is the government exists primarily to help me take other people's stuff and tell them what to do. If I was gonna name a blue dress, white dress dichotomy, that's probably the closest approximation I can come to one, but that would be something I would I would leave to political scientists, people who actually study this stuff, uh, which I don't. Um, so no, I don't I don't have a great idea. That was the sort of the cutesy little thing that I was willing to put onto a PowerPoint slide. Um, whether I think that's actually the the right way to frame it. Yeah. So I don't know if this is an adequate answer, um, or I, I guess I would say, I don't know if I fully believe this, but I do think there have been other periods in constitutional history when we have perceived uh, both the causes of, of uh, constitutional rot, the decline of republicanism, and the solutions to them it, as diametrically opposed in the exact same way that we do, or not in the exact same way, in ways that are almost as stark as we do today. And actually, I happen to, uh, one, of the, one of the things I didn't get to in my presentation was this really uh, rich quote from uh, 1935. This is the um, uh, Secretary of the Ohio Chamber of Commerce uh, testifying before Congress uh, in opposition to progressive taxation. Um, and, and 
you know, so so uh, what he says about the cause of republic, the fall of republics historically and today, uh, is uh, that the culprit uh, I'm quoting here is was uh, in ancient Rome the destruction of private property and the centralization of government in Rome. Uh, and he says, are we going to adopt the policies of destroying the accumulations of capital, capital upon which production and economic progress depend? Uh, and what he warns against uh, is, qu uh, again, quoting, uh, is that if we do, if we expand government, uh, uh, provide for redistribution through taxation, and uh, most importantly, in his view, eliminate judicial review, uh, the vicious cycle of history will be repeated in the United States of America. Um, now, you know, these sorts of historical resonances can only take us so far, whether they, uh, you know, you know, I, I do think that there are meaningful differences between that moment and this one. Um, but at the same time, I guess, uh, maybe I share some of Jack's optimism about the ability through the right sort of sets of reforms that build. Um, uh, so, you know, very briefly, um, I think it's right that the, the center of elite consensus has shrunk. Um, but I also think that if we correspondingly shrink uh, the role for the courts, my own preference is through um, uh, a super majority requirement on the court for invalidating legislation, which would take care of some of the most egregious examples of, of state and local in particular overreach, um, but uh, would give a lot of scope for the sorts of structural reform that we need that the court has thwarted. I think we could make significant progress in lowering the stakes uh, as all of the panelists have suggested is necessary. Um, but, uh, but I do, you know, I, I guess I do feel we are uh, at a point that's that's farther still than than where we were at the New Deal at the, at, at the same time. Okay. Uh, Joe Pry, we have about two minutes. So if you want to ask your question and then maybe we can have some popcorn responses. Okay, I'll do a popcorn question. Um, th thanks everyone. Uh, my secession came up in the last uh, session and came up again um, here. W w I found it kind of surprising. Maybe just I don't read enough stuff on constitutional theory. Um, which is undoubtedly the case, but um, what's the level of sort of just basic attachment and identification uh, in the legal academy with the constitution and the idea of a national republic? Um, yeah, I appreciated uh, Professor Balkan's comments about kind of the geostrategic log logic. You know, I think there's also you know, sort of basic, basic patriotic logic, um, Burkean logic about just, you know, it's the inheritance we have. Um, and but, you know, I, I understand the arguments um, about broaching the idea of secession um, or like in, in a thought experiment. But I'm just curious, um, how often does secession come up in, you know, a constitutional legal academy? And um, is, is that bad, <laughs> I guess would be the question. I mean, if, if Sandy is, is in the audience right now, I can't see on my list just because I have a chat function up. But if he is, this event with what, 30 people or something in attendance contains what, 75% of the constitutional scholars in the country who have addressed the question of secession. If we, if we put Akhil Amar on the panel, we might actually have all of them. Uh, I mean, am I, am I, it's, it's, no, it's not a major topic of, of, of conversation. Um, it, it's not, not something that is at the center of modern constitutional discourse. Good. Okay, so so this is this is the the end of our, our panel. Um, thank everyone for for participating. Um, Jack, I don't know if you have a final comment to that to that last question or not, but I just want to say thank you, Francisca, for keeping us all in line, which you needed to do. We talked too much. Thank everyone so much. So um, Gary, take it away. Thank you all for, for being here uh, for our final panel. Uh, the good news is we have an extraordinary panel of four distinguished scholars. Uh, we have Richard Albert, the William Stamps Parish Professor of Law at the University of Texas, an expert in the too oft neglected field of comparative constitutionalism. We're delighted to have you here. 
Um, our own uh, Jim Fleming and Linda McLean, well known, I assume, to most of the people here. Jim, the Paul J. Lyakos professor, Paul J. Lyakos professor of law, Linda, the Robert Kent professor, and uh, Robert Tsai, who, if he isn't already well known to people here, uh, soon will be uh, a, a terrific uh, a new addition to our faculty. Uh, we're going to proceed in the order that I just described. The bad news is that we have four distinguished people, which means time is of the essence. So I will send not very nice notes to people privately when the time starts getting excessive. Richard, the floor is yours. Oh, wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Gary, for running this session. I want to thank BU for hosting this program. I want to thank Jim, my friend and colleague, for inviting me to join you today. And I want to thank the BU Law Review for the opportunity to share some ideas, uh, ideas in progress, as you will see in the remarks that I share with you today. First, I want to congratulate Jack for writing this truly magnificent book. I think it's a book that is already, uh, in my view, essential reading to understand America's unique ecosystem of constitutional politics. I wanna invite you, all of us, to place Jack's theory within the global constitutional experience. The theory of constitutional time, I think must be understood as a theory of American constitutional time. Other countries, of course, may experience similar cycles, the ones that Jack describes in the book, but they interact differently in the United States. And the reason why has everything to do with the peculiarities of America's ancient constitution. In the time I have, I wanna explain this with three points. Point one, the US constitution is anomalous in the world because of its age. Point two, the US constitution is rooted in a distinctly amoral code. Point three, the unspoken predicate for the theory of American constitutional time is the popular veneration of the Constitution. These three features of the Constitution make American constitutional time pass differently. In the US, time runs at its own pace, on its own clock. I want to suggest that we can conceptualize American constitutional time as the sundial model of constitutional time, whereas many constitutions outside of the US and the world reflect the standard model, which we can think of as the hourglass model of constitutional time. So that's the ground I intend to cover very quickly in the time that remains. Point one, the US Constitution is over 230 years old, but the average lifespan of a national constitution in the history of the world is 19 years. This extraordinary staying power of the constitution has important unstated implications for the theory of constitutional time. Here's just one implication. A country can rotate through multiple rotations of the three time cycles only where the constitution endures for a long time. But no constitution has lived as long as the United States codified constitution. And so most world constitutions quite simply do not have the time to endure multiple rotations of these three cycles. What this means is not that the other constitutions do not experience one or more of these cycles because they do. The difference is that in much of the world, one rotation alone is enough to trigger the creation of a new constitution, but not in the US. In the US, the same constitution endures. Multiple rotations of the cycles occur and no new constitution has yet been created. Many moments and episodes in the US have yielded constitutional amendments or irregular constitutional changes. These would have resulted in a new constitution in most countries abroad. The reconstruction is the most obvious example of a change that would have likely resulted in a new constitution elsewhere. Point two. Point two is another contrast. World constitutions deploy many strategies to diminish, to slow, or altogether to prevent the onset of what Jack calls constitutional rot. Many world constitutions establish no-go zones no-go zones intended to protect democracy. They often make certain rules formally unamendable. They'll say, for example, in Germany, that human dignity is inviolable. 
Republicanism in France is unamendable. International law cannot be breached in Switzerland, and that's unamendable. I could go on. Many world constitutions also increasingly today accommodate the doctrine of an unconstitutional constitutional amendment, the idea that a procedurally perfect amendment can be unconstitutional. And many world constitutions sometimes adopt a strategy of militant democracy to protect liberal democracy. Under this strategy, countries take extraordinary actions to protect democracy, for instance, by banning political parties that seek to attack democracy. None of these three strategies exists in the United States at the national level. The DNA of the Constitution of the United States is distinctly amoral. What is right today may be wrong tomorrow. And this is permissible and constitutional because the US Constitution is oriented above all toward agreement, not the substantive matter. There's no good, no bad, according to the Constitution. There are only winners and losers in the battle for constitutional supremacy. Point three, when a world constitution passes through a convergence of the three cycles or just through one cycle, the result is often to mark a break in time by creating a new constitution. Remember the average constitution survives for only 19 years. This global experience, the standard experience represents what I suggest we call the hourglass model of constitutional time. A country reaches a point in time when the choice is made to flip the hourglass. The life of the old constitution ends and the people embark on a new journey with a new constitution. The US does not follow this hourglass model of constitutional time. It follows an alternative, the sundial model of constitutional time. Under the sundial model, of constitutional time. The US Constitution endures through swings from the highest of the highs to the lowest of the lows. It survives crises and shocks, both great and small. And all the while, the politics of constitutional time rotate through the three cycles of regimes and polarization and depolarization and constitutional rot and renewal. Even when constitutional time in the United States pulls the country down into constitutional rot, the political response is not to write a new constitution. It is to ride out the attacks on democracy and republicanism and to hope that politics will catalyze a period of constitutional renewal. Again, as always, the constitution through all of this remains solidly in place with no consideration given to breaking with time and writing a new constitution. The reason why the constitution remains intact through it all brings us to the core of point three. And again, it's a contrast between the US constitution and many constitutions abroad. The veneration of the US constitution is the unspoken predicate for Jack's theory of American constitutional time. The veneration of the constitution makes the constitution endure. And this creates a long temporal horizon for the three cycles to change, to rotate multiple times under the same constitutional text. Regimes change, as does the degree of polarization, and so too, the nature and scope of democratic and Republican values. But the constitution remains, though not necessarily because it should, it remains because of the self-reinforcing phenomenon of constitutional veneration. Americans venerate their constitution and therefore do not replace it. And as it endures longer, Americans grow to venerate it more. And as veneration grows, it becomes harder to do what many countries in the world do with regularity, which is to replace their constitution to keep pace with the changing values and views of the people. Around the world, when a constitution ceases to serve the ends to which it's directed, it's simply replaced. Since the year 1789, there have been 900 constitutions for 220 different nation states. And so if something is not working around the world, you write a new constitution. Because a constitution in much of the world is a means to an end, independence in India, the transition from dictatorship to democracy in Spain, and a new economic orientation in China. Replacing constitution is simply a part of life in many countries abroad, but not in the US for better or worse. In the US, 
The Constitution is both the means and the end. Veneration pushes constitutional change to judicial interpretation or to sub-constitutional means. And this allows the Constitution to persist in both form and in operation, both as a means to an end and as the end itself. I see now that I have two minutes, I'm gonna close. There's growing evidence around the world that countries are looking for ways to extend the life of their constitutions beyond their natural lifespan. And so rather than mounting an effort to create a new constitution when it has outlived its scope and its purpose, political actors around the world are beginning to use the procedures of constitutional amendment to transform the constitution into something completely unrecognizable. These are not constitutional amendments properly defined. They are in fact constitutional dismemberments, constitutional dismemberments. These are transformative changes that are self-conscious efforts to repudiate the essential characteristics of the Constitution and to destroy its foundations. In short, the effect of these constitutional dismemberments is to unmake the, the existing Constitution, though without breaking with time and all the while keeping legal continuity. We see this around the world, Brazil, Georgia, Hungary, Ireland, Italy, Jamaica, Japan, New Zealand, and Turkey. The list continues to grow. This phenomenon of dismemberment has two implications for Jack's theory of constitutional time. I'm gonna close with this. First implication, the widespread resort to constitutional dismemberment around the world instead of formal constitutional replacement suggests that political actors see merit in making transformative constitutional change within the existing constitution without breaking legal continuity. This preference for dismemberment over replacement may be inspired by the US model of a long enduring constitution that has been changed in ways both big and small using the rules of amendment in article five. Second of two implications, and then I'll close. As national constitutions continue to grow older, we will have more data points to evaluate the applicability of Jack's theory of constitutional time in constitutional systems outside of the US. I'm inclined to believe that the theory of constitutional time has application abroad, but that it has unique interactive effects in the US as a result of its ancient and enduring constitution. But I have to admit that I'm unsure. I'm just uncertain. We need more data. But I am certain about one thing, Jack and everyone here, which is that Jack has hit another home run with his new book on the cycles of constitutional time. And I wanna end with a wish to Jack. Jack, may the ideas and explanations in your book endure for as long as the constitution that inspired them. Thank you to all. Thanks so much, Richard. Thank you so much. Uh, Jim, you are up. And then I guess, we, should we go right into Linda from you uh, in, a, in a smooth transition? Yes. Let's okay. do Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, so Linda and I are going to talk about constitutional rot and civic education. Many have feared that the US is in the throes of a constitutional crisis or worse yet, constitutional failure. In the cycles of constitutional time, Jack Balkan assures us that this is not the case. Instead, he argues, the US is suffering from an advanced case of constitutional rot. Well, that's a relief, Jack, we were worried. Uh, notably, Jack does not prescribe a remedy for mitigating or overcoming the rot he diagnoses. Rather, he offers a message of hope. And the message of hope he provides is basically an assurance that the system will undergo renewal as it has done before when going through the cycles of constitutional time. Now, the renewal he anticipates seems pretty thin, basically an assurance that a new regime will emerge and for a time, the parties will not be so polarized and the government will function more effectively in addressing pressing national problems. And so the renewal does not seem to entail a renewal of the, of the civic character of the people themselves. So we're gonna suggest that the constitutional rot undermining our democratic republic is even worse than it looks to repurpose the title of Thomas Mann and Norman Ornstein's well-known book. 
Jack focuses mostly on rot within our institutions of government and among our elected officials. He identifies the basic causes of constitutional rot as political polarization, increasing economic inequality, loss of trust, and policy disasters. We found his analysis painfully apt and insightful, although reading his book in early 2021, it's hard not to add the nation's failure to reckon with systemic racism as a cause of rot. And we plan in our own work over the next few years to address the form of rot Jack mentions, but does not analyze fully. This is rot in the civic character of the people themselves due to the failure of government and the institutions of civil society adequately to inculcate civic virtues and capacities necessary to maintain our democratic republic. Now, to be sure, there are parallels between rot in our institutions and rot in our people. But the way Jack conceives the US is moving beyond institutional rot to renewal seems basically to be through the emergence of a new regime that accompanies changes in the demographics or changes in the strategy of parties to attract voters and the like. So the emergence of a new regime does not necessarily entail any changes in the attitudes of the people toward each other or their institutions, or to require any particular civic virtues or capacities on their part. Now, to be fair, in a subsequent article, Rot and Renewal, Jack writes that, quote, one might say that constitutional rot is the gradual loss of civic virtue and public spiritedness in the country's leaders and in the public as a whole, but the book gives but the book itself gives surprisingly little attention either to civic virtue or to civic education. And, and thus, in his otherwise rich analysis, the selves in constitutional self-government seem to be missing. The regime changes, the parties change, the institutions work better, but the people themselves do not seem to change for the better. Civic education, by contrast, targets the attitudes of the people themselves toward one another and their institutions. It aspires to inculcate civic virtues and develop capacities for responsible constitutional self-government. For example, tolerance and respect for others who are different from ourselves, reciprocity in our relations with others, mutual forbearance and trust, norms on which republics depend, as Jack acknowledges, a disposition and capacity to give reasons rather than make assertions. And what is more, civic education aims to develop substantive knowledge and civic skills as well as a set of dispositions and capacities, including to learn about and critically reflect upon the history of the US, basic texts, ideals, and principles, such as liberty and equality, as well as the shortfall between commitments and historical practices, also the capacity to engage in critical reflection about what programs and policies are needed to promote our ideals, as well as to care for and strive to further a common good that may not always coincide with our own good. Sorry, Gary. Um, and as civic educators insist, a rebooted civic education in the 21st century must also teach media literacy to help uh, people be discerning consumers of news versus fake news, as well as responsible users of social media. And for a variety of reasons, we believe the nation has neglected civic education and failed adequately to inculcate the civic virtues and develop the capacities needed to maintain constitutional self-government. We believe this has contributed to rot and polarization. One commentator even called the insurrection on January 6th a Sputnik moment for teaching civics, seeing a link between the white supremacist uh, conspiracy, conspiracy theory mob shocking disregard for the rule of law spurred by Trump's de demagoguery and the failure to instill civic virtue in the people. Uh, as school teacher Christy Nold tweeted, quote, each person knocked down, each person knocking down those doors once sat in a classroom. So we want to ask Jack, can you envision an approach to civic education that might help mitigate or overcome the rot in our people as well as in our institutions? Okay, picking up right there. Um, I think that one thing we plan to elaborate more in the published article, but I'll just preview a little bit here, is one foil we're going to use to talk about how not to uh, engage in civic education and, and, and a project of civic education renewal is the 1776 Commission's version of patriotic education, which was one of the parting gifts 
of the Trump administration. Um, and Trump defended uh, the, he established the 1776 commission to clear away the twisted web of lies in our schools and classrooms and left-wing indoctrination that distorted American history and led to rioting and mayhem and mobs seeking to tear down monuments and statues. And as you may recall, he singled out for special condemnation, the work of Howard Zinn, the 1619 project and critical race theory as quote, toxic propaganda, close quote, being taught in our schools and universities. Um, and Jim and I argue that this idea of patriotism is really more a form of tribalism. And um, the report itself, which was issued just two days before President Biden took office, uh, took basically the same approach, kind of blasting virtually every progressive movement in American history as trying to destroy the nation and its ideals. And even though President Biden swiftly disbanded the commission, we still think it's useful to examine the report um, as a manifestation of constitutional rot. And um, to relate to something that Richard Albert just said, the report itself has an extreme amount of veneration, not so much of the Constitution as the Declaration of Independence. And the tact that the report basically takes is the principles laid out in the Declaration of Independence were timeless, eternal, and universal ideals about liberty and equality. And they were all there. And sure, America isn't perfect, and they didn't fully realize them from the beginning. But the fact that the seeds were there somehow uh, it seems to go a long way in this report for uh, praising uh, various American heroes and, uh, you know, uh, uh, taking this more noble than not approach to America. Sure, it's got its flaws, but on balance, we're exceptional. And this leads to sort of minimizing the horrors of slavery, to explaining that they had to compromise on slavery because, well, they had to compromise. And, but the seeds of ending slavery were there from the very beginning. And therefore, it's not fair to stress oppression over freedom and so forth and so on. And a tactic that the report takes is one that many of you will be familiar with, which is accepting change up to a certain point, like the abolitionism uh, to end slavery and the civil rights movement and Dr. King, but beyond a certain point, it's all distorted. So the, the proper praise we should have for the civil rights movement, but then turns to criticism when it degenerates into so-called group rights and identity politics. And one of the stranger connections that the report makes is to suggest that Calhoun and white, white uh, apologists for slavery are in a direct lineage to uh, critical race theorists and people who argue for group rights today. So that's just a little flavor of, of some of the things that the report does. Um, and, and, and another idea is that those who engage in identity politics are somehow creating the group hierarchies, uh, not identifying and trying to eliminate them. And it's as if the commission has no understanding of the caste system that Isabel Wilkerson so powerfully wrote about in her recent book, Caste. The only mention of systemic racism in the entire report is in a paragraph indicting, quote, historical revisionism, close quote, that, quote, shames Americans by um, uh, highlighting, by talking only about the sins of their ancestors and saying they can be eliminated by more discrimination. So that's basically uh, the approach the report takes. Um, now, patriotism as we conceive it uh, should stem from a critical appreciation of the nation's striving to live up to the ideals, not a love it or leave it mentality uh, that denigrates those who continue to recognize, and not just in the 1960s or the 1860s, but today, uh, the ways in which the nation has fallen short of its ideals. Um, and I only have a minute or two left. So just to, um, uh, to reiterate, to go back to Richard Albert's point about veneration, um, uh, the, the idea is that any wrongs in American history stem from a failure uh, 
to realize the principles of the declaration, which are universal, apply to everyone and eternal, existing for all time. And somehow the fact that these words are there goes a long way to kind of exonerate all the failures to live up to these ideals. Um, and um, uh, Arth, in a later, um, and, and obviously we argue that by contrast to the 17, 76 report, arguments about structural racism and structural inequality have to have a place in a model of civic education. Uh, and as James Grossman, executive director of the American Historical Association observed after January 6th, the pathology is white supremacy, it's baked into institutions, it's baked into aspects of our culture. Students need to be taught about the US's history of white supremacy, as well as the many democratic struggles of civil rights. And one of the most disturbing aspects of the um, January 6th insurrection was that some members of the mob viewed themselves as comparable to the heroes and patriots of the nation's founding. And one tweeter said, I personally love it because you know what? It's how this country was built, the way our founding fathers stormed the British empire. Okay, so I believe I am out of time. I'm, I don't have a signal yet, but I'm sure I am. Uh, so I'll just leave you to say that Jim and I plan in a later draft to develop what educators engaged in civic education have called proven practices for civic education. And there is an encouraging body of knowledge about what curriculum works. But a cautionary note is that civic education is local and state, and there are 50 different ways to do it. And a 2020 CBS study of how black history was taught found a remarkable variation in, in the approaches states took to talking about uh, slavery, to talking about white supremacy and so forth and so on. So I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. I would have given you two more minutes, <laughs> but that's fine. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Jim and, uh, and, and, and Linda. Um, We'll go to Robert, and uh, then we'll give the panelists an opportunity afterwards to, to make some additional comments on each other. So the two minutes that Linda didn't get, um, I will give them back to her. OK, sounds like I'm up. Uh, great to rejoin everybody. Um, here goes. So as a, a former student of, of both Jack's uh, and Jack's colleague, uh, Bruce Ackerman, I find myself unable to fully escape our mutual interest in the mechanisms of constitutional change. And uh, as we all know, for some time, there's been profitable debate continuing in both uh, those who work in legal theory and also uh, in political science about how to understand both big moments uh, and smaller patterns of constitutional development. And happily, uh, Jack's new book unites many of these areas of scholarship uh, and, you know, as a longtime reader of his, of his work, uh, as well, it's uh, gratifying to see the threads of his own past work on cultural change and social movements uh, brought together within a, uh, within a coherent theory that tries to explain the broader patterns of constitutional development, not just what range of opportunities might be open to a president, but also what Jack argues are the cyclical features of constitutional politics. Now, in my remarks, what I want to try to do is to home in on something I, I think that Jack is tr trying to put uh, to one side, um, and that is uh, his departure from Skoranek's primary take on regime theory. Um, I want to focus on the place of the president in Jack's theory, uh, and I want to push him to perhaps say more, or at least I want to encourage him to say more about how a modern president actually functions in precipitating change or trying to thwart it, and also, if possible, to wring some more normative significance from what I understand to be Jack's otherwise descriptive, primarily descriptive theory of constitutional politics. Okay, so Skoranek. Uh, Skoranek famously made two famous observations about the role of a president in constitutional politics. First, that despite what many president, presidential candidates say, that is using transformative rhetoric. In fact, a president's actual opportunities are constrained by the political regime that he confronts upon taking office. And each president 
must seek a different kind of warrant for leadership that is tethered to the state of a regime or the state of politics. That means that for Skoranek, and I think also for Jack, it appears there are very few truly transformative or reconstructive presidents in our history. President Obama, despite his soaring rhetoric about change, wasn't one of them, and neither was Trump. Skoranek's second observation was a pessimistic one, that as political time stretches forth, there is a kind of cumulative effect of all this political activity and I guess legal activity that makes it harder and harder for a president to do truly transformative things. So what do presidents often end up doing? Uh, well, Clinton felt our pain. Obama invoked Lincoln repeatedly. Uh, Trump gained power by rallying white grievance, but never did anything about the plight of the common man other than to give him a nationalistic identity. Presidents start to form, perform, excuse me, transformation when it appears that the state of politics renders it impossible to actually deliver transformation. Richard Newstead had made a kind of similar point years ago that a modern president was little more than an invaluable but glorified clerk most of the time. I see Jack as trying to main, maintain fidelity with Skoranek's broadest claims, these two claims uh, at, at, at a high level of abstraction, but he also says that he wants to depart from Skoranek's account insofar as Skoranek was primarily concerned with presidential leadership. Well, I wonder what the significance of this move is on Jack's part. One possibility, and I'd love to hear more, is that Jack thinks that there is more that a president can do within a regime to either worsen rot or perhaps prompt renewal than Skoranek's otherwise baleful account. Another possibility is that Jack wants to create room in his theory for judges to act either on their own, sometimes in sync with a president, and that this judicial role that he brings to regime theory is something, and I think this is true, that Skoranek mostly neglects. Now, in focusing on cycles of rot and renewal, Jack explicitly links what he calls political rot to widening inequality and polarization, which are symptoms of bad state of things, but also causes of yet more bad things to come. And these bad things can be everything from an uptick in self-enrichment on the part of elected officials, to corruption among the donor class, uh, to a uh, diminution in civic virtue overall, something that uh, uh, Linda and Jim have talked about, or even increased racism and material inequality. What I wonder is uh, something that flows from my general agreement with uh, Jack's diagnosis. And what I've learned is that as an academic, when I feel like I agree with someone most of the time, I need to check myself. And so I wonder here whether Jack's definition of, of rot um, has built in too much um, of what progressive take as rot, but what some conservatives take to be actually in good faith as virtue. If so, if this is right, then we don't have clean cycles of rot and renewal in that way, but competing and overlapping cycles of rot and renewal with mirror images of what those terms mean. Let me turn to something that I think is related as we think about the president's role and, its, and the president's relationship to regime is Jack's account raises for me this question of how long is, is a regime? Uh, I know there's no uh, definite beginning and end, but I think this is something that regime theory causes us to think about. If a regime lasts nearly half a century or longer, is it still useful analytically for explaining presidential action? Jack says that Obama and Trump were both still operating within Reagan's regime, Obama as a preemptive president, and Trump as either an affiliated president extending Reagan's policies or a disjunctive president marking the end of that regime. Now, if this is a single coherent political order that stretches six presidents, it is one that lasts uh, roughly 40 years. And that's only if Biden gets a second term and is able to build on his first term's achievements uh, and Trump or someone with similar policies and style isn't reelected. Note that the New Deal and civil rights period is treated as a single regime that lasts roughly a generation as well. This brings some questions to mind. One, 
how do we really define the end of the regime? Is if it's purely generational, as one possible reading of, of, of these two regimes suggests, in a kind of Jeffersonian sense, then maybe a regime just ends and dissipates on its own, regardless of what else happens. If so, we don't really need regime theory as much as an account of generational change. Second, if regimes really last so many decades of parties switching control of the White House and turnover in the judiciary, I wonder, is the approach still useful for truly understanding what it's possible for a president to accomplish? If the answer is that regime theory at this level doesn't help us as much as we might think, then perhaps we already have enough pieces to work with. That with accounts of institutional behavior and accounts of party politics and some understanding of how social movements interact with presidents, then that all we really should be looking for is not regimes and where they begin or end, but rather for what I've argued as rhetorical institutional convergences between key actors, such as the way judges uh, talk and behave and how presidents act and behave. And if this is a, another viable approach than a cyclical one, then we start, we start to see syntheses of achievements in other places, irrespective of regimes say the 1940s and 1960s, and going back to something that, that came up in the earlier se uh, session, we see that um, we recognize that uh, external events such as war uh, can really affect uh, the, uh, not only policymaking on the part of presidents, but, uh, but also the content of, of, of rights and powers as courts understand them. Um, I wanna skip ahead a little bit because uh, I, I think I'm starting to run out of time uh, and focus on uh, this interesting question uh, that I've been uh, preoccupied with recently, they don't know what the answers are, um, that I'm interested in hearing what Jack has to say, and that is the connection between presidents and social movements. Uh, is this uh, a mechanism that is likely to lead to renewal or rot? Um, recent work by Sid Milkus and Dan Titchener say that uh, the increased reliance by presidents upon social movements is a new and destabilizing phenomenon. Uh, what they say about our history is, is that early on, movements won policy achievements with little involvement from the White House. And that when presidents got involved with social movements, they typically stepped in to try to quash them. And so in the early 20th century, for the first time, we start to see glimpses of president and movement interactions, but it's not really according to them, um, uh, with uh, LBJ's full embrace of the civil rights movement that kind of unleashes a frenzy of activity in which presidential candidates begin to uh, seek to gain and then hold power, uh, which for example, we see uh, with Donald Trump by appealing to insurgent movements like not only immigration restrictionists, but uh, the militia movement, uh, Blue Lives Matter and so forth. And, and so I wonder what Jack's theory has to say, if anything, uh, or whether he would be interested in some sort of modification, uh, modification of his approach to help us understand this relationship between a president and movements, this growing modality for constitutional change, and whether it is a compatible with our political order as designed, or whether it re represents a significant problem for governance going forward. Thanks so much for writing a provocative book. Uh, I have no doubt it'll be an instant classic. Thanks so much. Robert, I'm going to give the panelists an opportunity to react to each other very, very briefly. That will also give people in the audience a chance to put questions into the Q&A. Uh, we're going to do the same thing we've done before, put them in writing. Uh, I will acknowledge you in writing, and then we will hopefully be able to unmute you uh, to ask your question directly. Uh, but let me just go back quickly to each of the panelists and well, see if they... Gary, was I supposed to respond as oh, I did with the other panelists? Yes, because I'm a dope. Yes, of course. You know, there is oh, this, guy, there so is this be... guy who actually wrote a book that we're here to, to talk oh, about, yeah, maybe. Give me 10 minutes. Give me 10 uh, minutes. Let me see what I can do in 10 minutes. Go for it. <laughs> okay. Wow. Okay, so I'm going to go in reverse order. I'll go Robert, and then I'll do Jim and Linda, and then I'll end with my friend Richard. Um, so, uh oh, he uh, says friend. That means some bad news is coming to my job. <laughs> it's like when you say, with all due respect. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, I understand. Um, so uh, the question, the first question is a really important question, which is uh, people might see what I call rot, that is increasing uh, uh, inequalities of wealth and uh, party polarization as virtue, not as vice. And therefore it could be mirror images. Okay, so this book takes a decidedly non-neutral view about political economy. But I have a great group of friends on my side. They are Machiavelli, Montesquieu, the framers. Uh, okay, they're all on my side in arguing. And then of course, people later on, but who cares? Uh, they're all arguing that, that, that the political economy of a republic is crucial to its success. And therefore, when someone argues, but don't you think it's wonderful that we can unleash all of this innovation and, and it's true these monopolies are forming, but oh, think about how large the pie is getting and all that stuff. I say, well, you know, I have nothing against innovation. I have nothing against larger pies, but I do, I do think that it's, that it's hard to keep a republic going when wealth inequality gets too large. So in other words, I don't think it's just a mirror image. I think that there's actually a claim here, a positive claim about political economy and the survival of public. So that's the first issue that you raise. The second issue is how long is a regime? And that's a very important question in the political uh, science literature on regimes. Um, uh, I actually, in the notes, I, um, I, I quote an article by, I think it's Andrew Polsky, uh, who actually studied this, and he had a very interesting point that he made. Polsky's view is that um, a regime is sort of like uh, Benedict Anderson said about a nation, it's an imagined thing. It, it's what people think is a regime. And um, so what's interesting about these regimes is that people actually believe that they exist. They're, they're imagined, they're, it's imagined that we're living in this era and that they act accordingly. And the reason why that's important is if you look at any of these political regimes, what you notice is that they're able to work their will pretty uh, easily in the first years or so. But then after that, they just reach enormous amounts of resistance. It happens to FDR by 38, you know, he's just having really, his, his domestic policy just crumbles by 38. And, but we're still living in this era in which the Democrats and political liberalism are basically telling you what's possible and not possible in politics. That's an ideological formation as much as a formation about political power. And so that the best way to think about regimes is their ideological formations in which uh, the, the in political imaginary is constructed uh, by the dominant party, even though the dominant party is having all sorts of problems, as you know. Um, the Democratic Party goes through all sorts of upheavals uh, during this period. Uh, by you know, uh, uh, by thirty-eight, uh, Roosevelt's failed. Uh, by forty-eight, the party split, and Strom Thurmond bolts the party to run as a Dixiecrat. By sixty-four, uh, you have uh, the beginnings of third-party uh, stuff, and then in sixty-eight, you get a real third party, right, Wallace, and he threatens to do it again in seventy-two, but then he's uh, then he's shot, uh, so he can't actually fall. So the, 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 this, this regime is constantly being attacked, but yet liberalism and liberal ideology is basically setting the tone. So if you read speeches by politicians during this period, it's, it's gobsmacking what they think is an appropriate question of politics, which we would never think so today. I mean, because we live in a Reagan era in which all of our aspirations are chastened. Uh, they're chastened and the, the words we use are different. Even the metaphors that are used are different. So a regime is an ideological formation. So that's a very good question you ask. Um, it's not generational because it because the, the successful regime is one that's able to basically uh, uh, keep going as you get generational for replacement. Most important thing is if you can keep going and bring the new group of voters in and keep voting for your party, then the regime keeps going. That's what the Republicans do from 1860 to about 1932. They, they just manage to find new ways of keeping the new generations of voters in the party. They have to sort of do some mid-course corrections. That's McKinley's great achievement, but they just keep going. Um, so that leads to the next question. What's the relationship between presidents and social movements? Um, well, the answer is it, it all depends on what you think a social movement is. 
So if you think, so according to Bruce Ackerman, uh, my colleague, Jeffersonians are a social movement party and uh, the Jacksonians are a social movement party and the early Republicans are a social movement party and the Democrats are a social movement party, all right? But from the lit other literatures on social movements, people will shrug and shrug, what? That's not what's going on. Uh, and so another way of understanding the question you're asking has to do with what's the relationship of contemporary presidents after the progressive era to social mobilizations, because, but that's not a story about social mobilizations, it's a story about how the presidency changed. One, this is a chronic point. One of the effects of, uh, one of the effects of, of the progressive era was to turn the president into this sort of uh, policy Superman uh, who's supposed to lead policy changes, but he's also supposed to be the guy who manages uh, 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 deals with different parts of the party and, you know, he's basically supposed to broker conflicts, but he's also supposed to be Superman. He's supposed to be the vanguard, the People's Tribune. Well, these two visions of the presidency don't fit very well together. And one of the reasons why Skoranek thinks that the presidency is increasingly problematic is because of this misfit between progressive demands for the presidency and uh, and other uh, roles of the presidency. So I think that's just continued. That's uh, but the, the one of the things to understand in the book, the way I'm distinguishing my view from Skoranek is to argue that you can have change even if the president is not the leader, the spear. That there are lots of ways to have change. You, a party system can change. Uh, you can have change in, uh, um, in practices of politics. You can have uh, institutional changes. You can have changes in the administrative state. There are lots of ways to do change. The president doesn't, every, not every president has to be Abraham Lincoln. This is a way of putting it. And in fact, some presidents blow things up. That's Andy Jackson. Other presidents preside over the construction of things. That's FDR. So it's rather not making the president central to a cost the constitutional story. It's not presidents working with judges. If there's one thing you should get from my book, it's that I do not regard judges as really that important in the story, other than being uh, people who hold things up. Uh, judges basically make things difficult for everybody else in the system. I, I generally don't treat judges as heroic. They can cooperate with uh, the political branches and social movements uh, at certain points in history. And so things will go smoothly, but a lot of what they do is just make things hard and difficult and they're not sources of constitutional renewal. So don't even look to them as sources of constitutional renewal. Certainly not now. Okay, back to Jim and Linda. Jim and Linda, we were just talking about your idea in, during the break. Um, I'm totally on board with the importance of civic education. Uh, I don't say anything about it in the book, you're right, but I think that you can't really understand uh, a change, constitutional change without thinking about civic virtue and civic education. But here's the thing I want you to think about. So this is from an external perspective, as a, po a descriptive external perspective, as opposed to an internal normative perspective, which is your perspective. From a descriptive uh, external perspective, it is interesting to note how big changes in politics in America are accompanied by and often preceded by enormous agitation over what you call issues of civic virtue and civic education. So for me, what is interesting is not the 1776 commission, a rear guard action. What is interesting to me is the 1619 project as a harbinger of a rising political coalition asserting its vision of how to understand Americanness. And what I suspect will probably happen, I don't know it'll happen because I don't know if, the, if we'll have a new regime, but if you get a new regime, uh, which is led by a multiracial party, and if the other party eventually has to become multiracial too, which I think I predict in the first panel would have to, what you'll see is a new set of stories being told about what America is, how America got to be what it is, and what it means to be an American. These will be right in the heart of what you think of as civic education. That this transformation will occur will be shocking and upsetting to many Americans because it will not mesh well with their stories and their imaginary about what it is, what America is, and what it means to be American. But it won't be the first time this clash of stories has occurred. I, I was mentioning to um, uh, Laura Weinberg about the big fights in the early 20th century. 
as uh, the, the country absorbs a huge numbers of immigrants from around the world and has to retell the American story and explain what immig how immigrants will assimilate and become part of politics. But in the course of their assimilation and in the course of their absorption into American politics, they change American politics. They change the American story. Uh, they change the American imaginary. So that's the descriptive account of what I think you're trying to get at and your normative account. And I think they actually live together pretty well. Okay, last thing I want to talk about is um, is uh, uh, Richard's point. And here, here I want to be largely in agreement. So don't feel bad, Richard. I'm really agreeing with you. But I want to I want to make a couple of points. The the kinds of cycles that I describe in the book are the result not only of the longevity of American institutions, which is your point, but also of the particular uh, uh, constitutional designs that were that we still have left over from the founding and have been modified slightly. So one of the most important of these designs is to make it extremely difficult to get your arms around all the levers of power, that it just takes a long, long time, and it takes a long, long time for another, your opponent to do it too. And so that creates a kind of a building up of political pressure within the American constitutional system that takes a long time to finally be realized. And then it has a kind of inertia, it just keeps going. You know, and, right? and once you get control, then it's hard to get it, lose it again. But that has to do with design features as much as anything else. If, you know, staggered elections, presidential system, separation of presidency from the, uh, the Congress and so forth. So what I would be interested in your thinking about, because uh, you're a comparativist and you've thought about this, is what is the relationship between these systems and other issues? Like, for example, uh, oh, it's polarization. Polarization seems to be tied to first past the post um, and only two parties, uh, that only two major parties. So that's that seems to be part of what's going on with polarization. Rod is different, but polarization and um, and presidentialism regimes seem to be structured by design features. So in a parliamentary system, you have lots of small revolutions instead of a few big ones. So if the if you, you vote the majority party out and the new party comes in, the new party just enacts its agenda, but its agenda doesn't have to be truly revolutionary. It can be, but it doesn't have to be truly revolutionary. It just has to be different. And, and you've got the control of the parliament, so, you can go and nobody's gonna stop you. You don't have the impediments you have the, in the American model. The addition, by the way, of judiciaries post World War II probably complicates the story. So that would be interesting to think about. What roles the judiciary play in, in, in preventing uh, parliamentary systems from basically doing what they want to do? That's the first thing. And the second thing with respect to um, polarization is imagine countries where you ha don't have first past the post or where you have various forms of uh, proportional representation. My prediction is that some of these systems will have even worse polarization problems than the Americans, but many of them will have far fewer polarization problems than the Americans. It has a lot to do with the representational system they chose and the rules they chose for PR. Now that takes this last one, rot. I think you're onto something really important. Uh, the American system is designed to ride out uh, periods of rot and then make a comeback. I mean, maybe we won't make a comeback this time, but that's the whole point. Your point is, you know, that's not the only way to handle it. If you've got a, a period of rot, you can have a revolutionary party or revolutionary movement and just get rid of the constitution, start a new one. That may be a much better cure for rot, especially because everybody knows that you're starting over again. And, you know, so that, that gives people this sense of, we've got to build something again. By the way, back to, uh, uh, back to Jim and Linda. It's like a signal. Boy, we really need to inst we need to recreate our institutions and make them work. Um, you see what I mean? So in other words, there's this interesting connection between your argument and Jim and Linda's paper. So I think rot is the one where your thesis really shines and your husband has a lot to say to us. And it also suggests to me, and here I'll be more skeptical of, uh, of Hungary. I don't think of Hungary's use of dismemberment as an attempt to cure rot. I think of Hungary's dismemberment as an attempt to extend and make rot worse. 
So one thing to ask you is, under what conditions is dismemberment a cure for rot? And under what conditions is dismemberment a way to basically continue rot? So that's, those are my ideas. Thank you so much. This was a really great group of papers. A really good thing we didn't skip that. <laughs> wow. All right, I do wanna give the panelists a quick opportunity to, to, to have their say. And again, I will invite people to submit questions into the Q&A and we will acknowledge and hopefully unmute you as that happens. Uh, so let me circle back to, to, to Richard and then we'll go through the cycle and I will particularly make sure uh, everybody gets their minute or two. Well, thank you very much. I'm going to go very briefly because I know there's uh, a lot of uh, a lot of stuff to discuss, and we want to get the attendees uh, into the game. Jack, on 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 uh, dismemberment, um, that's precisely the point: is that a dismemberment is is outcome neutral. It does violence to the constitution, whether it's it's a good change or a bad change. So we can speak of the dismemberment of the Hungarian and Polish constitutions, just as we can speak of the dismemberment of the U.S. Constitution and the Reconstruction doing violence to the infrastructure of slavery in the original constitution. So it's a neutral concept. I want to put one point on the table. And, and Jack, by the way, um, the, um, the veto gates that you discussed, the design points, that's precisely the focus of the paper that I'm writing, which is that the heights that political actors have to ascend in the US to reach institutional consolidation, very high. And this explains why there is no doctrine of unconstitutional amendment in the US, because if you can do that, that itself is a source of le the legitimacy uh, in, in the both the process and the outcome. So there's no need to invalidate an amendment if you can get everyone to agree. Um, so so I, I love that point, but on rot, I'll just take a minute on this point. There's a fascinating disjunction in the book, a tension in the book between on the one hand, the cycles of regimes and the cycle of polarization and depolarization. And on the other, the cycle of rot and renewal. We need Balkan to understand rot and renewal because Jack himself is, a, is, a, is, a, is an invariable in the equation, right? Jack's view of what rot is and what renewal is is important to understanding that cycle. So there's a, a, a conflation potentially between the descriptive polarization regimes and the normative, rot and renewal. So this is a very interesting tension between these cycles. On the one hand, regime and polarization, but the other rot and renewal. We need Jack to understand what he believes is rot and renewal because, because my rot could be your renewal. This I think uh, is, is consistent with the point that Robert made. My renewal could be your rot. And so what for Jack is rot might not be the same for Jim or for Linda. So we need Jack in order to understand the cycle. So I, I just want to push that point out there that um, there's a, a, a both the normative and the descriptive happening here with no recognition of that point from Jack in the book until now when he mentioned it. Jim and then Linda. Uh, yes, um, I, I want to ask a question about rot and veneration. And I guess this is as much for Richard as for Jack. Um, because to hear you talk about Amer uh, people of the United States venerating their constitution, I wonder, well, so let me get this right. So people think the country's going to the dogs. Half of them think it's going to the dogs for one reason. The other half thinks it's going to the dogs for another. People hate, it's we're torn apart by strong polarization. Each half uh, uh, despises the other. Uh, people hate Congress. Uh, some of us hate the Supreme Court. Uh, at least uh, half the time, most of us find the president deplorable. Um, but we still venerate our Constitution. So you made it sound almost like the Constitution is royalty or something. I, I mean, it sounds like Sandy here, I think. Uh, you, you make it sound like no matter how poorly the government is functioning under a constitution, the government that was created by that constitution, people are still going to venerate their constitution. So what would it take for the people to question the constitution itself and think it's rotten or it needs to be replaced? Jack, did you want to go ahead? 
is a question directed at you. Great. So, so thank you. Thank you, Jim. This precisely is the problem. And you can tell that there's something in the water here in Austin <laughs> because this is a Levinsonian point, isn't it? And it's, it's, a, it's a peculiar thing about the US Constitution. The problem people see, they believe, is not the Constitution. It is the actors that do the business of governing under the Constitution, and they just have to do a better job of doing justice to the values of the Constitution and the vision of those who wrote it 230 years ago. But that, of course, is a mistake in my own view, if I could, if I could say so, because the problem is the Constitution. Now, I suppose Jack might say that, no, no, redemption lies in the Constitution and in social movements that can regain ascendancy, right, to bring the country back to a period of, of, of renewal. But that, to me, just begs the question, which is that you rely on movements to make things better. But what if the movements are not the movements that you want to gain ascendancy? Then you're stuck with a Constitution that is doing well, but well from the view of those who are ascendant not well from your perspective, which is why I think the comparative perspective is so valuable here. Because other countries, they're not bashful about taking the, the leap that Jack will not make, which is to say the constitution should set as supreme certain values that are unchangeable and that are enforceable by courts and political actors. Not because courts are the salvation, but because courts are viewed as legitimate actors who can apply force and power in defense of the values of the Constitution. This is not the culture of the United States Constitution. Linda, do you want to come in? You know, Gary, I'm a little concerned about giving time to, um, to the audience if we have anyone who wants to ask something. I mean, the only thing I would just say is that Richard's paper has made me think about a form of civic education that allows critical reflection and you know critical skills of thinking about the past, thinking about the flaws of the past, but also the, the tension between say the 1776 commission approach and the 1619 approach and sort of how you kind of find something that, that uh, includes um, praising American ideals while also recognizing a fairly tremendous uh, shortfall and flaws from the beginning. That's all I'll say. You know, Gary, there's an interesting uh, stat out there that came out a few years ago. Uh, a national poll was done to try to basically get at the questions that Linda and Jim, Jim and Linda are trying to get at. It's how well do you know the Constitution uh, and what do you value about it? And you ask people, well, what's the most important thing about the Constitution? And you know what the answer is? The plurality answer was, Miranda rights, it's in the constitution. And so the veneration of the thing, but not really a close familiarity with what the thing actually says. Let me give Robert his one minute and then we'll go to the queue and pick up Sandy Levinson. Great, I'll, I'll try to keep it, uh, keep it short. I'm, I'm reacting to Jack's uh, very eloquent answers to my questions. Uh, and it was particularly striking to me to hear Jack describe his understanding of a regime, not as a historical occurrence that we can, uh, I guess, uh, identify it with, with the usual sort of tools of, you know, when does a regime end and when does it begin, but rather um, he describes it as a kind of political imaginary um, uh, and ideological formation. The, the formation part of it, I get, um, but if, if this is so, and I wanna bring back his, his other earlier point about uh, reducing or trying to reduce judicial actors to kind of bit players uh, in, uh, in these cycles of rod and renewal, at least insofar as they can make things worse, but rarely make things better. It makes me, it makes me think that judges uh, still have the power uh, to keep a regime going if all it takes is enough people who are willing to keep this uh, a vision of, of what the earlier regime looks like going. Um, and this brings me to uh, something he writes about in the book, which is his, his take about the census case, because I'm not 100% clear what Jack's uh, take on this is, the, whether the census case rep represents deep rot or whether it's, an, it's evidence that the regime is coming to an end. Uh, you say that the, the case is an example of transparent interference 
No, no, but um, this case is rot. It's not the machine coming to an end. It's rot all the way down. You think it's, it's rot all the way down? Yeah, you got four members of the court believing conspiracy theories. That's rot. And there's nothing, nothing positive to learn then from Roberts's um, way out here in that case. Oh, no, Roberts is basically being an institutionalist and he's basically saying, look, you know, don't piss on me and tell me it's raining. That's basically his, his, uh, uh, his opinion. But what's interesting to me, as I say in the book, is not that Roberts is unwilling to engage in fantasy. It's that there were four members of the court that were willing to engage in fantasy. Uh, that's, that's not good. That, that's a sign of a, a decrepit system. Okay, fair enough. One last thought about this is, is um, if it's true though that judges can continue a regime going by continuing they can defend to- defend commitments. They can't they keep can it going. Well, they can let's, say, let's say they can rhetorically present what they believe yeah. to be, you know, yeah. until they meet resistance from say other political actors. Um, if that's true, then is it possible that the end of a regime can only come by us watching the turnover of the judges uh, and that that's what's really telling us when a regime ends? Well, that's a very Eurocentric account of constitutional development, <laughs> which I would be surprised from a law professor or a constitutional law professor. But it is true that you can argue, this is very Ackermanian, that the consolidation of a regime's commitments uh, occurs when uh, basically, the the dominant party is able to restock the judiciary with its friends, and and Keith Whittington has pointed out that there are periods of frisson between the holdovers from the late regime and the new regime, and that's the time when you get, uh, according to Whittington, departmentalist rhetoric. So it's it, but as soon as you are able to restock your friends, the judiciary with your friends, the departmentalist rhetoric goes away. But here's an, but this coming world and the world we're about to enter is an interesting test of what you're asking about. So imagine that the Democrats are able to basically be um, uh, effective in uh, gaining majorities nationally. Uh, they can control the House and Senate most of the time. They control the presidency most of the time, but nobody on the Supreme Court leaves. And so they just keep churning out Reaganite uh, you know, judicial opinions so what are we to make of that? And um, so it's an extended version of the struggle over the New Deal. Instead of it being over in two years, which basically it only took two years before it was over, it goes on for 10 years. That would be something we've never seen before. That would be really new. This means separation of powers makes it really, really hard for people to do things. Rather the point of the enterprise. Yes, I think I we have, I think we have Sandy Levinson unmuted. Yeah, unchained. Sandy <laughs> Levinson unchained. Right. Yeah, isn't the quick and dirty answer to Jim's question um, that there is nobody in the political leadership class, including prominent pundits or a significant social movement that is willing to talk about, let us say, our rotten constitution instead of a culture of constitutional rot that never actually has to address problems in the constitution itself, except perhaps for the low hanging fruit of the electoral college. Uh, my own favorite presidential election was 1912 because you had three serious constitutional reformers and the most able defender of the old order running for president. And that decade, you had quite a few significant constitutional amendments and a real conversation. Whereas what I often say about Barack Obama is that this former president of the Harvard Law Review never once in his entire eight years said anything interesting about the Constitution of the United States. And so even this conference today, which is, I th think, extremely interesting, I intended to spend time doing errands in the afternoon, and instead, here I am. Um, Levitsky and Ziblatt write their very interesting book, but never once suggests that perhaps the Constitution itself might 
explain the death of democracies. So, you know, frankly, this is why I've turned into a crank on this issue because there is such a wall of silence, generally speaking. I mean, Gary mentioned that, you know, he could literally count on one hand the number of people who take secession seriously as an issue of constitutional theory. You can also still count on one hand the number of people in kind of public who are willing to say interesting things about the Constitution itself as a contributor to our malaise. I'll jump in and just yeah, say, I, I, anyone I should take it completely, uh, Sandy. And I think back to back to Jack's point. This is all about institutional design, the design of the Constitution. Think about who can amend the Constitution. It begins with political actors themselves, and they have an interest in the existing state of affairs. Now, we haven't ever used, you haven't ever used, I'm Canadian, you haven't ever used <laughs> a convention process. You've tried, but haven't yet gotten to the point where you can convene a, a convention. And so you begin in the Congress. Congress doesn't have an interest in changing the Constitution. So think of what that does. That really does narrow the possibilities for constitutional reform, let alone replacement. Other constitutions around the world have what you can describe as multi-track ways of amending the Constitution that avoid this very problem. So Congress can't amend, OK? Other countries, you can initiate an amendment. Let's say the president could. Or a certain number of citizens can come together to petition on which action has to be taken to amend the Constitution. So many different ways uh, to amend a Constitution that just don't exist here, again, because the Constitution is so old. It's an ancient Constitution. It has not kept pace with the new innovations about how we govern ourselves around the world. And by the way, those of you who have not yet seen Jack's book, this is it, by the way. Lovely cover. Well, let me, let me ask something out of that. And, and I, I, I guess I can pose it to Jack. I can pose it to Richard. I could pose it to Sandy. Pose it. It's actually a heck of a thing to throw out at 454, since it's a whole nother conference. But one, one pair of concepts that Jack's book shifts back and forth between, and that a lot of the conversation here is shifted back and forth between, are a democracy uh, and republicanism. And uh, they are related, uh, but they are obviously not the same thing. Uh, depending upon what margin you're at, certain moves can make a system more democratic, but then less republican, and vice versa. And I just wonder how much of underlying everything here is a sense, maybe a blue dress, white dress, maybe not sense of what, what is the balance between those two related but distinct ideas? Uh, is it that there are some people who want the system to be more democratic and others who want it to be more Republican? That would certainly replicate a debate from several centuries ago. Just wondering whether that's worth bringing to the surface. Oh, well, I can talk about that. I, I can address that directly. It's something I thought a great deal about. So I, you, you as you probably know, Gary, there is a, a familiar a slogan, it's not a democracy, it's a republic. Uh, when people say that, I regard them as being stupid. The reason why <laughs> is that the, they're using the term republic in a very modern sense not in the sense in which the founders would have used the term. So, uh, so we have a democratic republic, but republicanism here is not just simply representative government, which prevents ordinary individuals from having a say in passing laws. That idea, by the way, appears in Madison mm -hmm. when he talks about republics. It's the deeper idea of republics that it seems to me is more important. And that is a notion in which the purpose of government is to serve the public good. The purpose of, of what public servants do 
is that they put aside their private interest in order to serve a public interest. They fight over what that public interest is. They don't agree, but they understand themselves as being devoted to the public interest. It also means that even though they form parties, political parties, which disagree, they put the interests of their country and the public good over the interests of their particular party. I haven't said a word yet about the about any democracy yet. Everything has been about the question of the aims of of public servants and their relationship to the public good and their devotion to the public good. And similarly, to go back to Jim and Linda's point, in a republic, it's very important that you create the kind of citizenry, the kind of participants in the republic who can be inculcated with a kind of virtues that cause them too to be devoted to the success of the republic, the public thing, and that they also work for the common good, even if they disagree about what the common good is. Again, I haven't said a word about any democracy. The problem with the slogan, it's a republic, not a democracy, is that it completely glances over this entire conception of republicanism. But it's this conception of republicanism, the common devotion to the common good, party over uh, country over party, the importance of civic education, the importance of inculcation of civic virtue, which is what we are most in need of. When I talk about a republicanism, constitutional law, I say it's a malady of republics, but I don't say it's a malady of representation. It's a malady of a certain form of society which believes in a public good. Now, as to the question of how much we should have indirect democracy versus direct democracy, you will not be surprised to learn that I think we need a little bit of both. I, uh, I, you know, I like having experimentation. I like different ways of organizing representative government. I do, uh, but I do not, I am not a, um, uh, what's the right word for it? Direct democracy guy. I don't think that's the, the, that's, that should be the standard case. My view instead is that you should have a mix of representational practices plus ways for ordinary citizens to participate. This puts me somewhere on the spectrum of the, it's not a democracy, it's a, uh, it's a republic group. But to me, that's not the important question. The important question and the crucial question today is the preservation of our republic, our public thing, our thing in which we all have a stake, in which we all value. And I wonder if that's exactly the right note on which to conclude. I believe we are at our time. Well, let me... Uh, let me say thanks to all the speakers and all the uh, folks who've attended. And um, we are planning to have a virtual reception now for anyone who's not totally exhausted by this hour and has to leave for some other commitment. So if there are any folks out in the uh, among the attendees who would like to join us for the virtual reception,